when the green light is on, your mic is live. Please make sure you speak clearly, directly into the microphone, again, so those joining us virtually can hear you. This will also help for the recording purposes. As for process, please note that there will be an opportunity for board member discussion after each agenda item, starting with the recent events. There will be an opportunity for public comment after the financial updates. If you wish to make a statement, please let us know in the room or use the Q&A or raise hand feature on Zoom if you are attending virtually and the moderator will unmute you. Now I will call roll. When called, please take a second to introduce yourself as the individual or as the designee. Secretary of the Natural Resources Agency. Brian Cash here for Secretary Wade Crowfoot. Secretary of California Health and Human Services. Secretary of Transportation. Lori Pepper for Secretary of Mashakin. Secretary of Business, Consumer Services, and Housing. Under Secretary Melinda Grant, here for BCSH. Speaker of the Assembly appointee representing the interests of private businesses. Good afternoon, Lupita Sanchez Cornejo with AT&T and representing private sector. Governor's appointee representing the utilities industry. Senate Committee on Rules appointee representing county governments. Afternoon, Jeff Tony, County of San Diego, Office of Emergency Services. Chancellor of the California State University. President of the University of California. Amina Asafa for a President Michael Drake. We have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we'll move to opening remarks. Director Ward, would you like to provide any opening remarks? Yes, thanks, Derek. Uh, well, thank you all, as Derek said, for attending. I know you all have uh, uh, busy schedules and uh, while uh, we don't have a, a lot around the table in person, I know that there's uh, others out in virtual land. So I hope that maybe we'll get to see some of you uh, at our next meeting in, in person. Uh, we. Um, also want to thank our, our stakeholders and our partners. Uh, we have a lot to share with you today on how we have made additional headway with the system operations and with the uh, earthquake early warning technology implementation. However, you know, there's uh, still quite a bit to do. Um, we must uh, ensure that uh, we collaborate and leverage our partnerships and the importance of, of you all being on this advisory board is extremely important. So we're uh, thankful again that you're here, but also uh, would hope that we participate and uh, ensure that we're getting all uh, everything out of you that we possibly can. Let me just put it that way. Um, we have some program updates today, our sector-based implementation segment uh, here. We also have excited to have Robert Sides here from the Regatta Seaside Condominium here to speak about the implementation of EEW technologies. It's a clear example of how our idea of EEW implementation can come to fruition. We also get a chance to hear from our partners at UC Berkeley and USGS. And uh, we have an update on our financial overview later today as well. But before we get started, I'd like to take the opportunity of a long awaited appointment that all of us in the state of California have long sought for sure. So I would like to ask Jeremy Lancaster to come up to the podium and introduce himself as our new state geologist. Welcome. Long time in coming, a long time in coming. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I really uh, appreciate being invited here, um, and uh, you know I've been the state geologist now for two months. A um, little bit of drinking from the fire hose right now, um, but I'm I'm starting to, to to get things moving and developing a strategic plan for the survey. I'm happy to be here as part of the at the earthquake early warning advisory board 
first time, I'm thankful for um, the partnerships that we have here, uh, the partnership with OES, the partnership with the academic institutions here, uh, with the USGS. Um, I wanted to highlight um, that the California Geological Survey has a strong role in supporting uh, emergency services. In statute, uh, we are required to respond to geologic events that pose hazards to, to public safety um, and infrastructure. Um, we support Cal OES um, in this effort. Uh, we support Cal OES by responding to landslide events, post-wildfire debris flow events, tsunami events, et cetera. But for earthquake events, we kind of have a very uh, special relationship where we work with um, the duty officer and the warning center. It's, a tw it's basically a 24 hour operation where um, after an earthquake occurs, it's a magnitude of 4.5 or greater. Um, we develop a quick report um, that summarizes the earthquake event uh, to the duty officer that goes up chain. Um, so we have, a, we have a strong role. I just wanted to highlight that we have a strong role in supporting OES in that respect as well. Um, and then, you know, as, as I mentioned, kind of across the board with all natural hazards, uh, we su support OES and their mission uh, to de deliver effective emergency services. Um, so I thank you for your time and attention. Look forward to uh, this meeting and listening in and, and meeting you all. Thank you. Yep. Welcome. Would any other advisory board members in the room or virtually like to make any opening remarks? Remember, if you are online, you may unmute yourself. Okay, um, hearing none, we will move to approve the me meeting minutes. There's a copy of the meeting minutes from the last meeting on May 10th, 2023 in the packet you received yesterday. Both were made available electronically uh, and well, in person. We will need to approve the meeting minutes from the last meeting as today we have a quorum. Please take a, a few minutes to review them. Lupita moves approval. All right, uh, thank you Lupita. Any changes, uh, Director Ward or from the board? Second, this is Brian Cash. All right, hearing none. Sounds like we have a motion uh, to pass and motion passes. Thank you, the minutes are approved. All right, let me run it back. I thought I heard a first and a second. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Yes, Lupita moved to approve the minutes. And Brian Cash seconded. All in favor? All right, motion passes, thank you. With that, as the Earthquake Early Warning Program Manager, I will now review some significant recent events. For this section, we're discussing earthquake events that have occurred since our last board meeting. We'll start with the Almanor earthquake that occurred on May 11th. You may recall this was the day after our last board meeting. So we just missed having a real-time demonstration of the system at work during a meeting. Mm -hmm. This was a magnitude 5.5 earthquake that occurred at 4.19 p.m. around Lake Almanor, a reservoir about 20 miles from Lassen Volcanic Center, but the activity had no connection to the volcano. There were dozens of aftershocks, most notable a 5.2 magnitude earthquake, uh, or excuse me, aftershock that occurred in the early morning of May 12th. For this event, 3,938 MyShake devices received an alert while approximately 100,000 Android users were alerted. In the days after the event, there were 9,392 downloads of the MyShake app. Next event uh, would be uh, the Ojai earthquake on August 20th at 2.41 p.m. A magnitude 5.1 earthquake occurred near Ojai, California in Ventura County. After the MyShake alert was generated, 194,168 MyShake devices were alerted and Google delivered approximately 5.6 million alerts to Android users. 
After this event, there were 43,734 downloads of the MyShake app. The largest aftershocks were three uh, magnitude 3.9 earthquakes, which occurred on August 20th at 3.18 p.m. and 10.25 p.m. and on August 22nd at 4.39 a.m. Most recently, on October 18th, around 9.30 a.m., an earthquake hit Isleton, about 30 miles away from us here in Sacramento. Now, this was the day before the scheduled test that was to be part of the Great California Shakeout drill, so you can imagine it caused a little confusion at first. But it was a real event that alerted 389,394 devices via the MyShake app, and 1.3 million Android users also received alerts. In the days following this event, we had 19,310 downloads of the MyShake app. One of the things we want to highlight with this earthquake is that it originally came in as a magnitude 5.7, but was quickly downgraded to a magnitude 4.2. This caused the alert to go out to a much wider audience than was necessary. But we have our partners with the United States Geological Survey to go into more detail about that, as well as the system performance in terms of latency, like we saw with the Ojai earthquake. With that, we'll move to a presentation from geophysicist and earthquake early warning coordinator with USGS, Doug Given, and Bob DeGroote, the USGS coordinator for communication, education, outreach, and technical engagement, and the chair for the USGS Shake Alert Joint Committee for Communication, Education, Outreach, and Technical Engagement. Hello, everyone. I'm going to, we're going to go quick to the next slide, Derek, please. So, so Doug is actually going to talk first about the magnitude overestimation for the 1018 magnitude 4.2 Ielton earthquake, and then I'll transition into a discussion about uh, the, the WIA system for the Ojai earthquake on August 20th. So Doug, all yours. All right, go ahead and move on to the next slide. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity to uh, interact with this group, and I'm especially excited that the uh, the empty chair at the Geological Survey is filled with the new director. So, so welcome to the fun. Uh, this will be part of the fire hose you'll be drinking from. Um, uh, as already pointed out, we overestimated the magnitude of this earthquake. Uh, by one and a half magnitude units. You see highlighted down there that our initial magnitude was 5.7. That was the peak reached. Um, and it finally settled down to a magnitude 4.4. Uh, location is shown on this map. Keep that in mind because it's location in the um, Sacramento River Delta is going to be an important part of this story. Um, so if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, these are the diagrams we routinely, routinely uh, produce uh, to show the evolution uh, of the event over time. The upper panel is the location error of the earthquake as compared to the final location as determined by the authoritative regional seismic network. We call this the COMCAT solution. That's the uh, common catalog. Um, and the bottom panel is the magnitude evolution. You can see that in the uh, initial seconds uh, after the earthquake occurred, the magnitude error was approximately four kilometers, jumped up a little bit, and then uh, finally jumped down to uh, less than a two kilometer error, which uh, is relatively par for the course for uh, seismic locations. Um, the trouble spot here uh, was primarily the magnitude. As you see, it started at 5.7, but then started to ramp down quite quickly um, and was down to magnitude 4.4 uh, within about 15 seconds of first detection. And I will point out that magnitude is, uh, is a bit of a squishier number than a lot of people realize. It, it, it is the average of the magnitude estimate from the suite of stations that recorded the event. And of course, in the first seconds of an earthquake, we are only using four stations. That's the minimum required uh, for an alert. Uh, so we'll take a look at how this uh, magnitude progression happened uh, and why the first alert uh, was so big. So if you move on to the next slide. Yeah, this is the meat of the discussion. I know it's a little bit busy, um, but it's got seismograms on it. So that's a good thing for the non-seismologists in there. These are just a record of the ground motion over time. 
uh, of the four closest stations. Now, there are five panels uh, in the lower left there. That is because the closest station uh, has two instruments, a strong motion instrument and a broadband instrument. So four stations, five seismograms. Um, the closest station was a Berkeley operated station uh, with the code name TWIT. Uh, that stands for Twitchell Island, but it seemed kind of appropriate because it was acting in a pretty twittish way uh, for this event. I'll, uh, I'll remind you that earthquake early warning is hard. Uh, to try to characterize something as complex as an earthquake with just a little bit of data uh, is hard and uh, you're doing your best effort to create a, an approximate answer as quickly as you can. So we're always fighting between the, uh, the competing goals of being fast and being accurate. So <clears throat> the, uh, the story with this one uh, actually had several contributing factors to that magnitude uh, overestimate. Um, first station twit was um, only 4.8 kilometers away from the epicenter, uh, but with that location error, um, it uh, it was uh, estimated to be about twice as far away. And so when you do the magnitude calculation, distance matters. As you know, the shaking uh, diminishes with distance, and that's especially true very close in. And so there's a sort of a hypersensitivity of the magnitude and distance relationship close into the event. Um, so the fact that there was a bit of a location error, um, uh, 3.4 kilometers in this case, uh, contributed about 0.33 magnitude units to the overestimate. Um, but the bigger player here was the fact that we were in the Sacramento River Delta, which is essentially a huge pile of poorly consolidated sediments uh, that are water saturated. Uh, it's, it's basically mud and peat, and it shakes like a bowl of jello uh, that amplifies the motion at the ground surface. And so that amplification of the soft sediments contributed about uh, 0.65. Uh, magnitude units uh, to increase the magnitude over the final estimate that was made with stations that were outside the basin. Um, the third contributing factor was that, again, because the station twit was uh, very close to the epicenter, the, uh, the S wave, the secondary wave, showed up uh, within the window that is typically used by the technique, which expects only a P wave to be contributing to the calculation. We use what's called a PD method, the, the displacement of the ground by the P wave. The S waves are almost invariably larger than the P waves. And as a result, the S wave essentially contaminated and overdrove the magnitude. If you look at the diagram of the seismograms on the left, you can see the five second window. Uh, that's the maximum window we use for the first estimate. And for the lower two stations uh, near that purple line, you can see a spike in the seismogram. Uh, that is uh, the S wave arrival. And then it's followed by that longer period signal you see, which is the surface wave arrivals. Uh, and those combined, uh, again, overdrove the magnitude upward. Um, and then there was another uh, somewhat contributing factor. This is a little bit esoteric, uh, but the algorithm is such that the more data you have, the more weighted that answer is. And Twitter, or Twitter, uh, sorry, station twit being the closest station, of course, had the largest record in length, and therefore it was weighted higher. So that station alone uh, was estimating that the magnitude was six, actually 6.2. Um, and when combined with the other stations, uh, which were also somewhat uh, over uh, driven by their location in the delta, uh, ended up with a final combined magnitude by averaging those sites to the 5.7 that we sent out in the initial alert. Again, as additional data came in at each of these stations and as additional stations arrived, um, things uh, settled down and got better. You can go to the next slide. So <clears throat> here's the, uh, the way the alert actually rolled out. And I wanted to highlight here a feature that we added to the system in August of last year that we call the alert pause feature, although it might better be called an alert limit. 
Um, because we know that it's hard to estimate the magnitude with only a little bit of information at the beginning, and we sometimes overestimate, we also at times underestimate, um, we uh, added this feature to limit the first alert to no more than 100 kilometers around the epicenter. And that's the, uh, the blue octagon that you see in that map. And so even though the uh, magnitude was overestimated by one and a half units, uh, we did not alert out to an area that would be commensurate with that magnitude. Instead, it was limited to no more than 100 kilometers for the first five seconds. And by the time we released that constraint, the estimated magnitude had dropped down to 4.9, which was much more reasonable. And therefore, there was little expansion to the area of alert. So the gray dotted lines, the octagons you see there, are the area that was averted uh, from being over alerted by this feature. Um, had this feature not been in place, the alert to the apps would have gone out to that largest polygon uh, that says MMI3 apps. And the WIA alert would have gone out to the MMI4 WIA polygon. So the alert pause uh, did its job in this case. And then the final slide, please. Um, so what do we do about it? Uh, in the immediate aftermath, of course, we we first had to understand what had happened. And it wasn't at all clear initially. Um, but uh, we, uh, we started that analysis. We uh, had significant consultations between USGS and Berkeley. Um, and uh, we decided to remove the station BK twit from our station list so that it would no longer overdrive event magnitudes uh, until we got everything sorted out. And of course, we posted on the USGS web pages a brief explanation as we understood it at the time uh, to let the public know that uh, we understood there was an issue and we were working on it. Um, and then later, after some deeper analysis by our system performance working group, uh, they produced two reports. Uh, about the event. That's the basis for a lot of what I've just told you. Um, and then we created a short-term working group uh, to look primarily at the EPIC algorithm, which is the one primarily developed by UC Berkeley, uh, and the one that is fastest in almost all cases in our system, uh, and to look at what we could do to improve its performance in cases like this. Many of the things that happened we knew were um, sort of an issue, but we'd not seen them uh, really bite us quite this hard. Um, so what we can expect to look at, and this is again a little bit technical, uh, we'll look at recalculating the, the PD relationship, especially close in, and in fact we'll uh, explore whether it's beneficial to have a two-part relationship, um, one calibration close in and another calibration farther away. Um, we'll look at implementation of per station magnitude corrections, uh, stations in the jello. Uh, if they always overestimate, then we can just correct uh, for that with a scalar value. Um, uh, we're going to look at S-wave identification within the PD window. Uh, there are seismological ways that you can distinguish between a P and an S-wave. Um, and then we're also going to look at bias corrections based on uh, azimuthal gap. This was actually a one-sided event. All the stations were on one side uh, of the event and because there aren't very many stations in the Central Valley. Um, and uh, so that will be uh, another thing we look at. There will be others as well. So we expect those um, that report and any changes that are uh, relatively straightforward to implement will be done um, by February. So that's it. Uh, I don't know if you want to do questions now or uh, at the end of the full USGS presentation. Uh, the questions will come at the end of the presentation. Great, thanks. So, so just as a bridge from Doug's talk about what he referred to as alert pause or alert limit, I, I think of it as somewhat like a safety net, some level. And for the Ojai earthquake, which was on August 20th, it was a pretty interesting day. We were having a major weather event in Southern California. It was kind of like everything happening at once. I guess that's what happens. Uh, and with the, this particular case, the earthquake was estimated by the Shakewood system at magnitude six, but this the safety net, the alert pause, uh, held everything within a 60 mile radius from the epicenter of the earthquake for those five seconds. And by the time the five seconds were up, 
what actually ended up getting alerted was for a magnitude 5.7. So that's a pretty significant difference. So it shows the, the great impact that, that this alert pause feature has on really sort of letting things calm down a little bit and then able to, to get a better sense. So, I mean, that's a, 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 in the over alerting part that, that people were talking about. I think it's a, a good thing to add. So I just wanted to remind uh, folks here is that, of course, we are working with many, many technical partners who are delivering shaker, shaker alert powered alerts on our behalf. And so this, this is just a reminder of a graphic that has sort of a, taken a slide that was originally a PowerPoint slide and put it into a graphic about where different alerting levels are and for what purposes. And so specifically for WEA, if we go to the next slide, please. And a way to read this, and by the way, the color on the far right matches the color on another graphic that we developed for, for what people feel uh, at various uh, shaking intensities. And for MMI-3, it's kind of like a heavy truck passing by your house. MMI-4 is where you're having you know, dishes and things like that and uh, windows rattling in your house. And so the way to read this is that anyone who could feel MMI-4, okay, this rattling of windows and stuff, or greater for earthquakes that are estimated by the shake alert system to be magnitude five or bigger could get a shake alert powered WIA alert. And that's how it works out. And I was inside the MMI4 region during this earthquake. So I got an alert from my shake and also from WIA. Uh, I live in West Los Angeles near UCLA. So just to give you a sense of how this works and that you can read the other graphic, graphics that way. Next slide, please. So of course, as, as Derek pointed out earlier, uh, this over 5.6 million shake alert power alerts were delivered during this event. Um, and of course the bulk were through Google Android and then also a really large number by MyShake. Uh, the distinction that this has, I think, and I'm, I'm not sure if Derek mentioned it or not, is that this is actually the most, the greatest number of alerts that have been delivered ever uh, in, in the history of, of, of this, of the system. And so that's something to, to interesting. Of course, the area that was involved was, you know, the highly populated region of, of Southern California. So it's no doubt that we a lot there. Um, just something about our messages, of course, we have messages are designed to be short and sweet and to get right to the point. Also, what helps is we're limited to 90 characters because we want to appeal to all phones, not just smartphones. But actually, it works out for the best because people know what to do right away and uh, to drop cover and hold on. So good stuff. Also, just to note, too, that on our event pages, uh, you'll see this tile or pin, as it's referred to as well, with the, the green circle with the exclamation point inside the triangle. Click on that and you'll get information about uh, how the shake system performed during these events. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a very busy slide. All I wanna show you here is, is a distinction because I think when you talk about people not getting alerts and the, the punchline of this talk is actually the last one of the last slides, but just to give you a sense of what the USGS does on the left in the, in the light green, all of the stuff that happens within the shake alert system from earthquake detection to, to, to data processing and then eventual production of the shake alert message, which is that data package that contains all the information about the estimates about location, size, and also shaking intensities. Um, we hand that off to the IPAWS portal uh, and then, they, then that system does something with it. So in the case of the Ojai earthquake, around five and a half seconds between earthquake detection and when the first shake alert message was, 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 was published. And I really like to point out the fact that, well, it wasn't really five and a half seconds because we don't know the earthquake is happening until it reaches the surface. So it, it was at a depth of about three miles. So it took about a second for those first seismic waves to reach the surface. So we're actually doing better than, than it shows. It's more than like four and a half seconds. But then of course, the iPods has to chew on it for a little bit. So that takes an, a, took a couple of seconds in that case, the information we got from the system. And of course, then they, what they do is they hand it off to the telecommunication providers to, uh, to, to get the information out to cell phones. And so we, and actually I have a slide, I don't know if we'll have time to get to it because I know we're running a little bit over time here. I've been, I've been counting the time here, so I don't want to take too much extra time, but we also have this for IELTS as well. Um, anyway, so that's, that's a piece here to know kind of how, long things take through the process. Next slide, please. So this is sort of the punchline, folks. This is the question that was asked when I met with Derek and Sam about what to talk about today. People are saying, well, I'm in the same room with my, my partner or whoever, and I, I got the alert, but, but, but he didn't or whatever. 
And so there are a number of factors, and this is an ongoing discussion. This is not something we're coming with completely all the answers. We've done a lot of studying of this, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Everything from you know, settings on, on the phone um, may have been either intentionally or unintentionally disabled. And that happens all the time. And we know this because we've actually talked to people who said, oh yeah, I shut off my emergency alerts. That's why I didn't get the alert on my phone. Or I didn't finish setting up my shake on my phone, so I didn't get the alert or something along those lines. Um, there's also messages arriving sort of broken that they, they're not quite complete. And so they won't be displayed on the phone. Um, <clears throat> there might've been some processing errors on the phone itself. Uh, and it could be you know, a factor of its age and the type of phone involved. Uh, they, the person receiving the potentially receiving the alert might have uh, had a, a drop in cell service, uh, and so there was a momentary drop, and they didn't get the alert. Um, also, this whole thing about resend cycle, and this is actually an important piece, is that the phone could have missed the first alert. Now, something like this happened to me when we did a WIA test in San Diego. I was down, we were underground, and we were doing a WIA test. This is back in 2019. I actually worked closely with Cal OES on this, and. Uh, when I was underground, I did not get the initial WE alert on my phone because I was underground. But when I went to the surface, I caught the resend cycle and I got the alert on my phone. So this resend cycle, if you miss the first one, but then you're there for the second one, you actually will get the second one. So it appears that you got it really late. And that was one of the issues that, that shows up here. So the resend intervals that are involved for, for these alerts vary from carrier to carrier. Um, again, these are all areas that we want to continue to look into. Um, if the end user, the person receiving the alert, uh, was in motion, they could have moved out of the alert area. So, you know, you see that the in the case of this, the, the MMI4 polygon for, for this event was kind of close to Long Beach. If you'd like maybe drove a little bit farther south into Fullerton or you were going to, you're on the 405 and driving into Orange County, then you, you may have drove, so driven, driven outside of the alerting area. So that's uh, something that could have happened as well. And then we have this thing called a, a WIA role around not disturbing you while you're on a data session. And, and the idea is that you don't necessarily want to get this blaring alert on your phone while you're talking to somebody. It's very loud and very disturbing. I mean, it's meant to do that. And so um, we're not really clear what this means. It's likely during a phone call, but um, what breaks through may vary from carrier to carrier. So this isn't a lot of quantitative information about what, but these are the sorts of things that we're hearing about. I also, um, we spend a lot of time on social media trying to, to figure out what people, people's experiences are and why they may, may not be getting alerts on their phones. Uh, this is all stuff that we're continuing to look into. And this is why we do so much social science around ShakeAlert. I don't know if I have any more time to talk, but there's a next slide. Um, we did two tests in, in 2019, uh, one in Oak West Oakland, another one in San Diego. I mean, the one thing that is not show, that I didn't show in the slide about the process is that, that, that how long it actually takes to get to the phones. We know that, that the handoff to the cell carriers takes and, and the delivery takes a little bit of time and that varies. But one thing we learned from the two tests we did in West Oakland and all of San Diego County, this was in, in uh, San Diego County, was in June of 2019. Um, we know that alert delivery time to get to phones, actually get something on their phones, just once, once you know, from when we accepts the, the, the uh, information to when it gets to phones, is on the order of something four to, of four to five seconds. So that means once the, the, the ShakeLert message is uploaded to the, to the iPods gateway and then something gets to phones, that could, be, that could be in the order of four to five seconds based on these studies. But again, these studies were done back in 2019 and I think it certainly merits the fact that we need to do more. I'll stop there um, because I realize we're, Doug and I took more time than we should have, but thank you for the extra time and we'll wait for questions later. Thank you. Appreciate your attention. Uh, we still have some time for uh, questions. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Director Ward, would you like to provide any questions or comments? No, just thank you. Um, got a lot of incoming, as you can imagine, with those. So that this really helped me kind of understand the whole process Great. and understand it. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, Chief Deputy or Deputy Director. Right. Do any board members wish to ask a question or provide comment in the room or virtually? If you are a board member online, please unmute yourself at this time. I have a question. Um, I mean, I suffer from the UC. I have a question about the alert um, pause. 
So I understand it's to um, account for maybe an overestimation at the start. What if the estimation is accurate? Does it limit who it gets notified to? Um, it depends on the size of the actual earthquake. Uh, there is a uh, penalty or cost to limiting the uh, first alert. Uh, in that uh, if you uh, limit it, you know, it, it's at 100 kilometers to somebody 101 kilometers away, they didn't get it, they would have gotten it sooner, perhaps, had that alert not been, or that pause not in place. Um, but there are a number of arguments that it makes more sense to do it than not, uh, including the fact that, well, you know, earthquakes take time to grow anyway. Uh, in the first five seconds, the rupture will not have proceeded into a massive earthquake that uh, would, ex you know, that would have allowed us to recognize it and uh, and alert to a larger area faster anyway. Uh, we actually ran multiple scenarios with different limits for different earthquake sizes, uh, and we chose the values we did uh, as the optimal uh, alert radius and pause time. Um, so you're you're right to point out that um, yes, there could essentially be a five second delay, for example, introduced immediately outside that uh, 100 kilometer area, but. The point is to get people alerted who are closest to the quake and most likely to be hurt by it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi, this is uh, Jeff Tony in San Diego. I had a question regarding the actual test on the day of the shakeout. Um, there was a location given of San Francisco. Was that by design? Did you mean to put a location, specific location in the test or, or not? I think that's a question that our, our colleagues at UC Berkeley probably can answer related to the, the decision of what the tests actually appear like. So I'm not trying to, to pass the buck here, but I think it's probably a question they need to answer. Yeah, yeah that was not a, uh, that was not a system alert that was yeah. uh, specific to my shake. Okay. I, think I, would it, just ca I would just caution that in the future to them. Uh, just given it's a test may cause some confusion for the public. Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure they have gotten that message from other quarters and are will consider that in the future. Thanks. Yes, this is the distinction between what, what the USGS does and what our, our technical partners do is that in the case of the MyShake test that was done is that there is level decision-making that's done by the partner to decide how and what terms they do the test under. So, yeah. Thank you. And, and we'll hear more from our team from UC Berkeley later in the meeting today. Uh, once again, thank you, Doug and Bob. Uh, any additional questions from the board? Seeing none, uh, we'll now move into sector-based implementation updates with a presentation by Robert Cides of the Regatta Seaside Condominiums, who is here to tell us about the journey to implement EEW into their high-rise building. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me. Uh, I wanted to start off with thanking all of you guys on behalf of a community of 500 people. Uh, we're excited to have this technology. We're excited to have adopted it before anybody else. And although we've not had the opportunity to use it, thankfully, and I hope we don't before I retire even, um, it's, it's comforting to know that we do have it. So thank you for that. And I also want to thank Sam personally. She offered a lot of help as I was uh, getting this ready, and uh, she was very responsive. And so uh, you guys have a, a real keeper there in Sam. She's a great person. Uh, you know, when I walked into the building, I came up from, flew up from L.A. today, and uh, a lot of people comment on my, uh, my Avengers cover of my iPad. And I walked into the building, and there's all these uh, security things and uh, people walking me through, automatic doors, Zulu time up on the wall. I felt like I walked into sort of the agents of shields. And uh, so anyway, uh, it's been quite a quite an adventure coming in here. If anybody comes up to me after my talk and uh, says Hill Hydra, I'm going to get a little concerned, though. But anyway, um, 
my building, I, I just want to talk about how we, a residential high rise, 224 units, how we adopted this technology, why we did it, um, what it has provided for us as a benefit, and then also perhaps talk a little bit and give you some advice. And then, of course, offer my services to help you down the line if there's anything I can do. Uh, Regatta was, as far as I know, the first residential high rise in the nation to tie into the system and have earthquake early warning. We were very excited about doing that. We're, we're happy to be a partner with you guys, and we've always felt that way. And so, uh, so let's get started here, and uh, we'll start working our way into it. Back in 2016, a very large insurance broker in the industry knew the regatta was very forward-thinking, very tech-savvy. And so he heard a presentation from somebody, I'm not even sure who, and he gave me a call and he said, hey, Robert, you guys might want to look into this. You're in LA, you're kind of in sort of the target zone, and it's something that you can wrap your mind around. And I thought, why not? You know, it was a pretty exciting thing to hear about. And as we started to look into it, it we started to see some possibilities. And of course, the, uh, the bottom line, we'll get to some of the benefits of it here in, the, in, the, in a minute, but it could be very substantial when it comes to um, preventing injuries or, or saving lives and things like that. So, um, so we were really um, aggressively jumping into it at that point. We had already partnered with some other technology companies. We sort of helped pioneer a water sensing program and a, and a few other things like that. So uh, we, we have a, probably one of the best engineers on the West Coast that I brought from Hawaii with me. And so we were capable of looking at this. And then we have a board that's been very supportive of uh, some of these issues that, you know, it's going to be one of your hurdles, I think, is getting behind these, these uh community boards that may not be able to wrap their minds around it. And so uh, in that regard, I would be a big supporter. And, and uh, I think once you can break through that ice, I think you can probably get this technology adopted a little more. Okay, we can move to the next slide. A little foundational information, Regatta Seaside. Uh, we have uh, 18, 19 floors, four subfloors where, um, a post-tension concrete building. It's a pretty solid building. Uh, we're right at the edge of Marina Del Rey. As far as we know, we don't have any faults that are underneath us, um, but we are in obviously uh, an area that is a big concern. Uh, the Marina is a beautiful place, um, but we're also these, we got all this alucabon and glass out there. And as we know from the Northridge experience, glass can be a problem, uh, could be a big, uh, injury creating item. And so, so we have a building that, although is perhaps not susceptible to collapsing, if you want to call that, you know, the, the ultimate, but, uh, but we do have some areas of concern and we'll talk about a few of those here in a, in a few moments, but, um, uh, but we also have, you know, a very expansive, uh, group of amenities. Not only do we have a wonderful community full of individuals and most of these units are occupied um, most by homeowners some by renters um, but we also have screening rooms and pools and you know all that kind of stuff I, I like to say I came out of the hotel industry I like to say that it's kind of like run like a hotel but it's a homeowners association which is pretty cool actually and so uh, so anyway if we can move on to the uh, the next slide we'll start digging into this but we're gonna we look at risk management. We have one of the best risk managers in the nation, if not the best. And we take problems much like earthquake would be. And we try to analyze it in three different phases. You know, what can we do ahead of time? What can we do during? And then what do we do post? And how do we, you know, fix things or pick up the pieces, so to speak, afterwards? And so you'll see that in some of these. Uh, we'll talk about some of the experts that we bring to bear because at Regatta, we don't just kind of jump out nilly willy. We try to find the best experts we can to get going. And I'll start off here. You'll see ImageCat with Bill Graff. He's our property um, engaged ImageCat to come in and give us a seismic report, which I'm happy to share with anybody. And what he did is he dug into the engineering, the location, and gave Regatta and our board sort of a sense of what would happen in certain earthquake incidences. And so we wanted to analyze, you know, what our risk was. And so he was able to generate, you know, what's, what do we expect in a 500 year event or a thousand year event and things like that. And we incorporated that into our sort of thinking on how we're gonna deal with earthquake. 
of course, foundationally before that, we also hired Asperta, which is John Nixon, to come in and tell us, hey, what's our building worth? Where are we there? What, what's at risk? And so we had, uh, he uses uh, some pretty advanced algorithms to figure out what our building is worth. Right now, he says we're worth 240 million. And last year it was 180 million. So as you can see, construction costs have gone up incrementally or exponentially probably. And, uh, and so we also did that. If we could go to the next expert here. Okay, the um, Clifford Trees is without a doubt, probably the best risk manager for community associations in the nation. And we just, I just happened to know him from my association back in Hawaii, where I came from. And uh, we, he, we were able to hire him as our risk consultant. So he sort of oversees a lot of this and sort of tells us where to go and how to go about it. Risk, uh, Cliff was also, interestingly, he wrote most of the books on risk management for community associations. So it's kind of nice to have that important expert behind us. Somebody that you guys might want to reach out to at some point. And uh, he's very forward thinking on these things. And so uh, he's been a great help to us at Regatta and help kind of pull everything together as we got, as we started to see what earthquake early warning can do for us. We can go to the next one. And then we also have a very good broker, um, our insurance broker, which kind of deals more with the after the event type deal, uh, Kevin Miller. Alliant Insurance is probably the largest commercial broker for, for earthquake and catastrophic risk in California. And so uh, most properties you'll find, and, and this is another hurdle for, for you as a board is, you know, most will go to a insurance broker and say, just give us what we need. We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> and so, and then the broker brings it to them. Whereas at Regatta, we try to dig into there and find out what are we getting? What can we get? What can we tell them to bring us. For example, at uh, Regatta with our broker with Clifford Trees as sort of the overhead, you know, we started to get things like non-owned non, non debris removal, uh, tsunami coverage and things like that. And so, um, so it's a more holistic effort when it comes to the earthquake. And then finally, I think we have one more, yeah, early warning labs. And Josh Basham is um, our contact there. And he's the one that actually brought this technology to us and actually made it easy for us to implement. And so we were very happy to have Josh. And so we could go to the next slide. So the challenge was, of course, our location, Southern California. It's a place that's right in the middle of, of risk. Um, although regatta is strong and stable, um, we all know that the seismic waves can be amplified, amplified in a high rise setting. We haven't had a big shaker since we put the system in in 2016, but I do know that I call it the Easter earthquake of whenever 2010 or 11 or whatever, when everybody's pools were sloshing in LA, um, our post-tension building was swaying and you could see it, especially from the top floors. And I live on the top floor of a neighboring building. I could see it from there as well. And so I'm not sure what it is about the construction, but it does, it does amplify it, or at least it felt like that as a homeowner. Regatta has some unique and, and potentially dangerous designs just specific to us we have this huge glass atrium over our lobby. And you can imagine with the front desk right under that, that's probably not where you wanna be if a big earthquake comes. Um, this, was prob this was a very expensive thing that the developer put in. And uh, one of the things I have as the manager of this community, a lot of comfort in is knowing that if we can get our staff that's there moved before the shake starts, then, I, then they're in a safer location. And so that's one item that's just really particular to our building that I really worry about, not to mention all the glass out there. If you're outdoors, uh, you know, out at the base of Regatta on the exterior. And unfortunately, you know, people, when an earthquake comes, they think, oh, we're running outside. <laughs> you know, we're training people. No, no, you don't run outside, you run inside. <laughs> and get under something, hold on, and just, you know, let, you know, just take care of yourself that way. And then finally, um, you know, we also worry about, we have quite a few, we have a large contingent of our community that is elderly and however you want to define elderly, but we have people all the way up to the nineties. And um, as those of you may know, and I'm in my sixties, you know, as you get a little older, you get a little more, you know, unstable. And so we do have concerns about folks getting in a protected and a safe location 
because if the shake happens and they're up and about, then there could be some real catastrophic results from that. And especially if somebody's out on a balcony, you can imagine being out there and then, you know, the handrail might hold them in or whatever. So, so we worry about that. These were the challenges we were looking at. And of course, the opportunity for us at Regatta was um, it gave us a chance to get everybody into a safe location, or at least theoretically, right? Depending on the amount of um, warning we have. But uh, as we'll see in a moment, the, uh, once the alert is triggered, then it goes through the entire building, goes into everybody's units, goes into the common areas. Um, if you are anywhere in Regatta, unless you're sitting in your car or listening to your favorite radio station or something, um, you will hear the alert and you'll have an ability to sort of get yourself in a safe spot. And so that was one good thing that we have looking for us. But we also, you know, the other thing is, is that it can give us an opportunity to continually train, not just the staff, but the homeowners. And so one thing that uh, the county, the state does really well is train for fire. You know, we're always having fire drills mandated every year, Reg 4. And, uh, but we don't really have a lot of the mandated stuff for earthquake. So that's something that perhaps needs to be looked into. But this gives us an opportunity by having the early warning to come in and start training people, training the staff, training the homeowners. And that's been a very, very good thing. And then it also, the other thing that's really nice about it is that it's just, it, it can also shut and turn off things and turn on things and stuff like that. Um, by that, I mean, it could recall elevators before the, the shaking actually starts. Right now, the technology is just to recall when the shaking starts. Wouldn't it be nice to have them already recall before it starts shaking? Um, as many of you know from Northridge, a lot of people got trapped in subterranean garages. This can open our gates. Um, we do have an earthquake sensor on our gas, but it's nice to have a double sensor there. And we're looking at other things that we may potentially be able to do with this because it's a pretty simple technology. Once it kicks in, um, we might look at some water things, turn off the water, you know, because we understand, you know, whoops, sorry, the shaking of the building may in fact break water pipes. And that's really the bane of our existence in any high rise community is water oftentimes. And so if that gets going, it, it, that, that's just a real catastrophe. So anyway, if we can move to the next slide. So, uh, so what we did, and thankfully it was brought to us early on, was you know we just needed to find the right partner. And in this case, in our case, and I understand there's more than just early warning labs, but um, Josh Basham was uh, came to the table. He was a, I guess you guys call him an LTO, licensed to operate, and um, and he made it very easy for us. And that's something that I think probably needs to go out to other communities. It's not hard to implement. You know, and, and in fact, it's almost easy, it's too easy in a way. So, uh, but I want to mention that it's nothing to be afraid of and it's very easy to bring in. And so uh, early warning labs kind of came in, interfaced with our community as communities do. We oftentimes don't make quick decisions. And so a lot of people don't want to, a lot of contractors and whatnot don't want to deal with HOAs because, well, we're HOAs, right? We got to listen to it five times before we do something. And it took us about five months from the original discussion to actually implementing it. I think that took a little longer than it would have otherwise, but a lot of that was because we were sort of a pilot, you know, so we had to sign all this paperwork to, you know, and all that good stuff early on that probably doesn't need to be done now. But after the on-site meetings, you know, we developed a plan, we started putting it in motion, we installed it. It's a, basically a little black box in our um, fire control room used to be about the size of a DVR. Now it's probably the size of a modem. There's really not much to it. Um, and so the installation was kind of plug and play. We have that great engineer I was talking about. He was able to interface on this. So we were able to get it rolling without any problems, plugging it into our fire control system, which is really what was the main thing so we could get the announcements out there. And so, uh, so anyway, and the cost for us right now is $12,000 a year. So that's what we pay to have the earthquake early warning. When you factor that or compare it to the half a million or so we spend for an annual premium on earthquake insurance, that's really a drop in the bucket, right? So, but it, it's probably a, you know, maybe a hurdle for a lot of properties. So, so I just wanna mention that. And, um, you know, maybe you'll have to work on it from the state side to get some subvening of that. 
Implement implementation details, as I mentioned, the box is very easy to put in the fire control room. We have its own little shelf and it's it's sitting there monitored by Shake, by not Shake Alert, by um, Josh Basham. We get emails every now and then, hey, it went offline for some reason, you need to go check it out and we'll go bring it back up. Um, and right now we have it set to trigger at the MMI of four. So that's our trigger point now. We've had a lot of internal discussions on that because you know, at one point, it's kind of nice to get people used to it, but you don't want them to be getting what they think are false alerts. So we're trying to find the, the nice midpoint on that. And then uh, our staff, we've had to develop a training program for them so that they know what to do when this goes off. You know, we, not only do they have to get up and leave the front desk or depending, there may be engineers in the building or as oftentimes happens when something happens in a catastrophe it usually happens at two in the morning on christmas eve right so um so we have to train people what to do for our 24 7 staff and we hope some of that goes by osmosis to our homeowners we train them continually and so anyway that's and we've we've done that since we've in, in you know installed the system we go to the next one and this will show you or give you an example of what our warning sounds like test on earthquake. So I don't want to say it's as obnoxious as a fire warning, but we want it as noticeable as a fire warning. And so if you're sitting in your unit at regatta, you know, reading the newspaper or whatever you're doing, watching the Netflix or YouTube, you're going to hear that. And when it's triggered, it's triggered. And it's going to, everybody on the property is going to hear it. And so that's the goal. Everybody seemed to be very receptive to having that. So uh, as of right now, the homeowners, although oftentimes they don't think of it, those that do are glad that it's there. And it's a nice comfort for them. So, um, so anyway, some of the benefits to having the earthquake early warning for us as a community association is really just to save lives and prevent injury. And that's really the bottom line, right? It, I mean, we have all these ancillary things that help us, but you know, at the end of the day, we want to make sure everybody's safe and as much as we can. And that should be the goal, and I think presumably is, for most homeowners associations throughout the state. It's just a matter of getting your foot in the door and getting it going. We believe... Uh, we haven't had a chance to really use it yet in a big quake, but we do believe that we'll probably have enough warning time, especially if it's a catastrophic one from San Andreas or something like that. I mean, there's other there's other faults in in LA. I'm not an expert; you guys are. Um, but we're we're hopeful that for whatever the big one is, however you want to define that, that we'll have enough time to uh, to actually react and get into safe locations and safe places. Will everybody cooperate? Perhaps not. Will everybody believe the warning? Perhaps not, like the fire warning, you know. But for those that do, it, it's a great tool to to for safety, just a straight route to safety. And so, uh, so anyway, and then we also, as I mentioned, we have a fair amount of elderly people in our building. So, you know, it's real important that we get them down. We can't have them walking around. And so, um, so that's another benefit to this. And hopefully that gets through. We just keep training annually when we do our fire trainings. And then also, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we want to get people out of really risk zones, which is under that big atrium. If they're out in the pool, you know, they can get in if there's enough time. If they're sitting our valets out in front under all the glass of the building, come in, get in a secure location, hold on, get under something and hold on. And so I know as a manager that that brings me a lot of comfort knowing that we have the ability to warn everybody. So we mentioned a few minutes ago about automating things. Um, you know, we have the ability to do the shutoffs. We're looking, we're having difficulties. And I mentioned that previously, you know, getting the county to sort of understand the technology behind the elevators. We haven't been able to implement the elevator portion and that's unfortunate, but we, we want to do that because just, that's just common sense. Let's pull the elevator down before there's a shake. But for some reason, you know, everybody's kind of got, whatever the technology is there in their mind. So we need to break through that and maybe you guys can help us with that a little bit. 
And as far as opening gates, we have a trigger gates and get those open as well. Um, this does offer us, as I mentioned, the platform to train everybody. That's, that's almost as critical as having it because people don't think of it. You know, it's funny, you know, it's sort of like any risk measure, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to analyze it until you've been through it. And so we're out here sort of, you know, we're, we're the band, so to speak, you know, ahead of the head of the parade, but, um, but we're always trying to get people to think about it. And if they haven't experienced one in a while, um, perhaps that's something that's out of sight, out of mind. So this training gives us a chance to keep going back and hitting them with it. Now, me personally, growing up in Southern California, I've been through a few shakers and I was in Hawaii when we had that big one from the big Island. I was on Maui actually. And, uh, in a house that it wasn't post tension concrete it's probably call it post tension wood uh, in Lahaina, which unfortunately is gone. Now the house is gone. But anyway, um, when we had that close to a seven, I think incident back in October of one year, I, I was up to watch some football and then the whole house started doing this number, you know, what's a homeowner do? I ran outside and then I remember my expensive piece of art on a high shelf. So I run back in to catch it when it comes down. But anyway, uh, the things that people do during earthquakes, that kind of taught me a little bit about, it. you need to think about it ahead of time. And so we try to get the homeowners to do, to do that. And then there's one last value add that I want to throw out there that you guys maybe can, you know, I don't know if you can quantify it, but it's something you can certainly mention is we had a homeowner leave a neighboring building and move into our building because we had the earthquake early warning. And uh, she felt much more secure because we analyzed the risk. We dealt with the risk. We insured for the risks. And we also have the warning. And uh, she was a single individual. And she, in fact, she's on a uh, news report where they spoke to her. And she says, I went there because of what they did with the early warning. And so there's a level of comfort for that. And so if we could go to the next slide. So here's some ideas. I don't know where you guys will go with it, but certainly I offer myself to help however I can, but how can Cal OES help? Well, community outreach, you know, and that's probably a difficult thing to think about because you have, you know, tens of thousands of community associations in, in the state. Um, clearly there's ones in San Francisco, LA, other places that are probably more, you know, prioritized for whatever reason. Um, but to reach out to that, um, I think that you can start looking at, we have uh, a couple different entities that deal directly with us as a homeowners association. One CAI, which is a national organization, community association Institute of which I'm a member in our building is, and then also CACM, which is a statewide organization. They all have regular meetings. Uh, they have training, they have education. I would encourage you guys as a, as a board or to reach out to those folks. Um, there's eight sectors of CAI you can go to and just say, hey, I want to get out and talk to you guys. Can I do a luncheon? Can I speak to you? Or maybe you create some video. I'm not sure. But, and with everybody on Zoom nowadays, maybe that's a good thing to do is create a sort of an intro that defines the targets that you guys are working with, whether it's a community association, a commercial building, a rail or whatever, you know, that may be something that you guys can, uh, can look at, but um, let's see what else. I already mentioned the elevator stuff. Uh, there's legislative options. I'm not sure that this technology, and this is not being a naysayer, but I mean, I think we get so caught up on, Sometimes the minutia in Sacramento, maybe this thing has such benefit. If we can get the legislature behind it and say, like your fire system, just put it in. <laughs> you know, you got to do it. And at least for for high rises, maybe a you know a house or a you know a large scale community that's just a bunch of individual houses, not the phone will work, right? But uh, for something like this, it's a very, I think, a, a key and critical item to look at. And, and you know, with 50,000 homeowners associations, California alone, I mean, you got your work cut out for you, right? And I don't know how many, I, for years, I was saying we were the only residential high rise in the nation, you know, tied into the early warning. I hope there's some more, but I have not heard about a bunch. So uh, anything I can do to help you reach out to that, I'm certainly happy to do. And as I mentioned, that CAI and CACM, that would probably be critical when it comes to homeowners association. 
extremely critical. So keep that in mind and I can put you in touch with people there. Um, as far as insurers go, um, there's probably just a handful and getting to be less of insurers that handle these big properties in California. But if you can get them on board, I know Alliant now, who is our broker, has gone out and spoke to other properties of a similar profile to ours and said, hey, if you looked into this, you should call Robert. I've talked to some people over the phone. I don't know if it's been implemented elsewhere in, say, the Wilshire Corridor in L.A. or whatever. And then uh, finally, you know, maybe it comes down to money. You know, there's some kind of incentive, you know, maybe we're offset to the cost or the annual cost or something. We're all used to paying to keep our fire systems up. Well, why aren't we just in the same vein doing it with earthquake? It just makes a lot of sense, right? And so um, for us at Regatta, kind of pulling everything back full circle, um, we are just thrilled to be in partnership with you guys on this thing. Um, we are hopeful that it would, well, we're, we're confident actually, that it would have a big benefit to us in an event, and especially a catastrophic big event. And as I mentioned earlier, with the early, during, and after, I mean, clearly we, we're even working on things right now. I was on the phone yesterday dealing with a uh, structural engineer about engaging him for an after the event. So I'll have him on retainer. So, but when it comes to the early part and the during part, I mean, really, what else can you do? And so this is just tremendous help. And so I was thrilled to come up and participate in this. And I'm willing to answer any questions on why we've done it. We've been there for seven, eight years now, right? So, well, thank you, Robert. That was that was really wonderful. Um, I have a question, though. You you mentioned at the very beginning of your presentation that you had kind of a tough road to get your board kind of their minds kind of wrapped around the need. What specifically was the contention with the board members? Was it money? Was it just not understanding the technology and the benefit of the technology? Or what specifically could you help us with in, in terms of understanding the kind of reluctance of the board up front? Well, you know, I like to say that uh, you know, I had a board meeting yesterday. So here I am in another board meeting. And uh, as I say in HOAs, it's uh, the board meeting is a descriptor or a definition of most of the people in my audience, <laughs> you know, but anyway, uh, money. I think that the, the, my board is pretty tech forward. So, you know, you might run into that roadblock in other places or speed bump. For us, it was not. It was really the money. And right now it's probably even triply difficult because all of us HOAs, not only are we dealing with higher labor costs and construction costs and, you know, we don't do deferred maintenance. We fix things as we go. But just yesterday I put out 40 grand. We got approved in a special board meeting for something. And so the boards are always trying to be good stewards of the money. And so that's why I think if you could get a hook, if you can somehow hook them with the money and, and say, look, this is going to be, we're partnering with you. Here's a little bit of whatever the state, either whether it's a, you know, associated cost deduction and something else, or you're partnering in on the, on the price for us, our building can clearly afford 12 grand a year. It's no big, well, I don't say it's no big deal. Every penny counts, obviously, but, um, but it was money was our big thing. Any board members wish to ask a question or provide comment in the room or virtually? If you're a board member online, please unmute yourself at this time. Please note we've provided a discussion question to spark conversation, but the board may raise any questions or comments related to the subject. Board member Pepper, you may ask your question. Great, thank you. And thank you so much for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, and I'm happy to hear you know, how successful you, you have been thus far. Um, I, I had a question about the elevator recall issue. Um, we are currently working on a study around how to integrate the system with airports and the elevator recall is one that's just, you know, in, in my mind and in, in kind of our um, conversations uh, given that you would, of course, recall all the elevators as soon as the alert goes off. Do you think that was um, what you're saying? Is that a financial issue? Is that something that um, you just need to do more with um, education and exposure to the system? Were there certain um, arguments that you got pushed back on in talking about that 
with a particular issue. I guess I'm just looking for some additional direction if you have it. Sure, sure, happy to. You know, actually the elevator recall was something that was probably one of the things early on that we felt was the biggest benefit. Once you've had an elevator and somebody's stuck in it, um, you realize how critical that can be, and especially if it's for any degree of time. We also find that homeowners, uh, from the most part, that's one of their biggest fears, being stuck in an elevator. So um, in our case, we, we have our elevator contractor is Mitsubishi, one of the larger companies in the state. And we went to them and said, we're going to hook it up. And now we don't have the ability to actually access their system. You know, it's, it's not that it's proprietary that we don't own it, but they kind of control the, the, the gig there. And they then said they were going to take it to the city or county or whoever it is to make sure they can do it. And we're told that we couldn't do it. And ironically, uh, that's such a benefit to this system that early on when we adopted this technology, we were on news reports all over. We were on Good Morning America. We were on European things. I mean, it was crazy. I was on all over the world on, 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 the, on the screen, so to speak. And we always showed the elevator recall as a benefit but we have not been able to get the approval to hook it up. So I, when I spoke to Josh last week about doing this presentation, he said he may have a workaround. I, I don't know what that is, um, but I think that's one of the biggest, probably from a homeowner's perspective, gonna be one of their biggest safety points. So education may be the answer there. Um, maybe it needs some statutory thing, I don't know. Um, but I know we would do it in a heartbeat if we can just get the okay for Mitsubishi to do it. And so, and we want to do it. We want to do it yesterday if we could. And so, um, and I'm willing to help you guys work through it. If we're the ones that, hey, let's carry this through from Regatta and see what, what we hit, happy to do it. Just, you know, get me in touch and interface me. Was there a reason given by the city to Mitsubishi about why they wouldn't allow them to do that? You know, my feeling was they didn't get too specific, but my feeling was that, like any type of bureaucratic and or uh, you know code issue, there's sort of a hesitancy to do something different. And even though, as I was mentioning at that time, I'm like, well, we can keep the old system going. We're going to recall it before it even needs to be called with the sensors. Just let us plug this one in. Keep your other one going as a backup, you know. And we didn't get any headway there. And so I think maybe some of that is, uh, and you guys probably know it more than I do, but I think sometimes people get stuck in silos and I suspect in the government, it's probably that way. I know when I was in Hawaii, I was, uh, you know, we had the Department of Health and we had the Department of Land and Natural Resources, both dealing with beach issues. And I created a nonprofit to do beach replenish replenishment. I was the first guy to ever get the two to get in the same room together. <laughs> no, everybody's in their silos. And I think maybe it's a little bit of that silo mentality. So uh, whatever you can do to assist us, hey, I'm all in. I'm curious if perhaps, and, and I'm speaking completely outside my knowledge base, but if there might be some testing or something that needs to happen and how this system may work with like a fire system, if there's concern about um, any sort of infringing on kind of another system that would also recall the elevator or some other emergency system. So. Who may be hitting the, yeah, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. I think if I were say regulator for lack of a better term, I don't know that I would just want this technology. I'd probably want that backup because what if there's a problem as we see, you know, what if the internet's down and it doesn't do it right. And that's your only recall. So I think it needs to be sort of a, both of them. I think have whatever the existing technology is in there. And then have this one kind of override it and bring it in sooner. So that's my thoughts anyway. Hi, Lori Najera, Deputy Director at Cal OES. Um, I want to go back to two of the benefits that you touched on. You spoke both about insurance and real estate value. And one of the we've seen both of these kind of come uh, in come to the point where they accept and reward, if you will, the, the benefit with regard to the physical seismic retrofits. And we 
are hoping the same thing will happen with earthquake early warning. You know, if if a, a homeowner or a building is seismically retro, I, I'm sorry, um, gets earthquake early warning, then they can see their insurance costs come down. They see their real estate values go up. Um, and I'm just wondering, since you've had this now for a couple of years, are you seeing that with um, not only the corporation, um, but the individual homeowners, is their insurance coming down because of this or um, are their property values going up? Okay, the best I can answer that is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're probably an exception to the rule in the sense that our community association really digs into risk management. What that means is when we go to the underwriters or when the broker goes to the underwriter annually, since we purchase earthquake insurance, and that's where it would show up, obviously, um, we prepare essentially a 400 page packet that we market the property to them. And what's the first thing we lead with? Earthquake early warning. And, um, and when I talk to our broker, when, it, when you start looking at sort of large catastrophic, catastrophic risk, I can't speak as an insurance person that's experienced, but it sounds to me like that there's a little bit of voodoo involved. You know, it's kind of how they're feeling that day, who you speak to, what, what do they feel is important, right? <laughs> and, um, but I can tell you this, it's, it's been a real, talking to Kevin Miller, our broker, he said the earthquake early warning gives them a lot of assurance that even if, even if they can't get their minds around what it does, that we're digging in and managing. And so I think unequivocally it has saved us, although this last year was extremely difficult. It was the first year that we had to move off of, move off the needle. We had hundred percent insurance for as long as I've been there, I've been there 15 years. We actually had to go down to a, a measured amount for a, uh, you know, an expected earthquake. It's the first time I had to do that because where we were getting $180 million insurance a year before, we're only able to get 50 million now with a deductible that's half that. Whereas before we were 5% deductible for 180 million. The insurance markets have seized that much that most homeowners associations, we chose not to do that. It was a political decision, obviously, and a money decision um, because our premium would have gone from 500,000 a year to over a million dollars a year. And so we were telling, you know, we're kind of sounding out the homeowners, say, look, you want to spend a couple hundred bucks more to have full earthquake coverage? Quite honestly, I'd have done it as a homeowner if they asked me. I'm in. But most of them were, you know, it was kind of mixed, probably a third, third, third type situation. But to answer your question, I think it does help um, for those that'll actually have a broker that'll mention it. Um, but you, that gets to the education of the broker, right? And uh, in our case, you know, the broker is kind of amazed with Cliff Treese's overview and then what we do to sort of manage our risk. Um, but that's, that, that's one of your hurdles there. That's one of the things you need to get to. As far as the individual homeowner, uh, we're not, we've not heard anything there. And it's the same with our water technology, right? We have a bigger risk of water, you know, and vertical community. Water starts up on the 18th floor, guess where it's going? And it's going to happen on Christmas Eve at one in the morning, right? And take out every unit below it. And we now have 3,000 water sensors in our building that are monitored from our front desk. So whenever there's water, boom, we're responding to it. And so, but you would think that that would get homeowners a discount on their personal policies. And as far as I know, it hasn't yet. So there needs to be some looking at this from the insurance side, but in their defense, there's probably not enough people doing it to get them to think about it. Well, thank you very much for this presentation. And it was very, very helpful and truly um, our hope is that we get more building owners and homeowners associations that have the same thoughts you do and adopt, and then we can really work on those insurers to get the cost down. Well, if so, you go to the legislature, I'm there with you. Just give me a call. I'll come up and <laughs> talk with you. So, that would anyway. be great. Um, thankfully, we don't have the, uh, the after the event experience, but at some point, I'm sure we will. It's not a matter of if, it's when, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, thank you guys. And thank well, you thank for you so being much. our partner in this. Really, thank you so much. And thank so you, much. Sam, for everything you did Congratulations, well. that's great. Robert, thank you. Um, you know, we would like to share that as a team, we are a small team, but we are working towards many of the, the uh, ideas that you've pushed out and we appreciate your presentation. And uh, one of the benefits of having such a diverse um, 
advisory board is we look forward to working with you all to figure out how we can work together to address some of these policy issues that are coming about. Well, Thank I can you. tell you on Regatta's side and my side personally, anything that can mitigate risk, I'm all for. So anyway. Thank you guys. And Robert, one last thing before you go. If you thought this room was impressive with our with our time, I'm gonna have my aide in the back with his hand up, walk you over to our state operations center. Oh, I'd love to see that. Okay. I'd love to see it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Great idea. Um, all right, we will move to the next item on the agenda, uh, research and development, where our partners at UC Berkeley will present on an exciting project they have been working on. With that, I would like to introduce Julian Marti, the operations manager with the Berkeley Seismology Lab. Julian, before we get into the presentation, would it be possible to have you start by revisiting the test alert that was sent out on shakeout day on October 19th? Thank you, Derek. And sure. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to talk about that and uh, then to, to move on to the presentation. Um, so every year, my shake participates to the Great Shakeout Drill uh, in coordination with Cal OES and other partners in order for um, uh, people to practice uh, life-saving uh, actions. So the plan was to, uh, to send the test alert at 10, 19 a.m. on October 19th. And uh, so prior to the uh, day of the Shakeout Drill, uh, MyShake successfully sent a number of notifications uh, to its user base to inform them about the upcoming uh, test. We also extensively uh, tested the delivery of uh, test alert to all our uh, beta and, I mean, I should say alpha and beta devices. And uh, however, uh, to um, add to implement some last minute changes to the code in order to take into account some uh, user feedback that we had received uh, very recently uh, about some very, to solve issue with some very specific types of operating system and devices. And when implementing those last minute changes, uh, we missed one testing step, which made that the alert, the test alert was delivered earlier than uh, initially planned. After that, uh, we, since many, Partners, they were ready to uh, practice life-saving actions at uh, 10, 19 exactly. We made the decision in coordination with Cal OES to still deliver the alert at 10, 19 in order for uh, these actions to, to happen. Um, maybe I could add that at no point in time, the capability of my shake to deliver a real alert for, I mean, a real-time alert for a real earthquake was that's com two completely different systems, the live system and the test system. And also the fact that, of course, we have already reviewed the, the process test alert and they have already been modified to make sure. I could also answer to the question about why the uh, alert uh, message uh, mentioned, the test alert message mentioned an earthquake. Work with different user groups. And the feedback that we had received was that they wanted to feel that this test alert was for as real as possible earthquake. So some user group mentioned that they wanted to have the location for the earthquake. Have a different location. Uh, however, after the test alert, the 1019 one, uh, we received feedback that then, yes, people of maybe uh, doesn't exist. Um, I'm not sure what at this stage what's the best. I think, you know, when you have a very large user groups, we have almost 3 million uh, registered users, you will have always different opinions. That's not the only topic where we have to find a good compromise, but uh, we have time to discuss that with Cal OES until the, the great check Try to find the, the best compromise. Thank you, Julian. Um, before you begin your presentation, please maybe move the mic um, a little uh, up or a little closer to you. I think you were coming okay. in and out a little bit. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me know if you, yeah, cannot hear. Um, okay, um, I think most of you have uh, 
are familiar with the MyShake application already. Um, so MyShake is a mobile application that delivers quick early warning alerts to, uh, to uh, users in California and most recently in Oregon and Washington state. Uh, that's currently the only statewide earthquake early warning application. It's available on both iOS and Android. As I said, we have uh, close to 3 million registered users. We also have uh, accumulated uh, more than 210,000 uh, experience reports that were shared by users on how they experience specific earthquakes. And over the last five years, we have issued alert for more than uh, 90 uh, earthquakes. So one of the, the mechanism we, uh, we use to know how successful we are and also to receive that feedback from the users, as we just mentioned, is to look at uh, comments we receive on the Google store, the app stores, the emails, uh, all the social media. And, um, and so I included some of those for the most recent earthquakes we alerted for. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to read some of them, but I think I need glasses. Uh, so, but uh, it was just, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I need glasses in any, in any case, but uh, so, uh, yeah, this is just like some of this feedback we received for the really the most recent earthquake we are alerted for. One of them is the Ohio earthquake that was mentioned earlier by the USGS. Uh, the first one, for example, alerts work. The app alerted me several seconds before the Ohio California quake today. The second one, I haven't had a chance to properly review this before because there haven't been any earthquake, but we just had one and this went off with an audible alert several seconds before we felt the shaking, truly amazing. I'm not gonna read all of them, but for example, the next one worked as intended today. Most of the time I just get alert for earthquakes around the world, other time about earthquakes nearby with a unique sound, but today I got an alert I have never heard before followed by the word earthquake, earthquake, then maybe like three seconds later, we get hit from an earthquake in Ohio, which is about 40 miles away. I can see how this would come handy during the big one. Again, great early warning earthquake app, worked perfectly yesterday. Uh, I recently downloaded this app when prepping for an earthquake. Yesterday was the tropical storm Hillary. I think that's the case that Bob mentioned earlier. Um, and the app notified me 10, good 10 seconds before the earthquake hit and gave me enough time to get safety and text a friend before I felt it. And I received the Ember alert. I think the user means the way alert. And this app gave me valuable time much sooner than, uh, than uh, the other mechanism. Early alert works, it works, uh, alert receive. So those are just example of, uh, of the, 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 the very positive feedback we receive and uh, especially uh, from users mentioning how useful the, the app was like uh, for them, for their family, needless to, for example, when users say needless to say, I have added your app to all our phones. Uh, next slide. So, I mean, I will read this last one because I like it very much. Uh, someone uh, said, I felt like a prophet. I downloaded this app after the last earthquake in my area. 20 minutes ago, I got a very clear alert with graphics earthquake warning, drop cover hold at the time to read it, hesitate thinking these don't actually work, do they? And uh, then get out of the bed, yell across the house to my kids before the chandelier started to swing from the quake. Um, uh, but I, I mean, so the epicenter was a 5-5 and we are 60 miles away, but I actually hesitated before reacting and still had that much time getting everyone in my family on this app and I will not hesitate to react next time. Um, someone mentioning it would be great if that would work on Apple Watch, but in fact, that's already the case. We informed the user about that. Uh, and uh, basically one of the, the reason I wanted to also uh, highlight all this very positive feedback is I think that this positive feedback I should not only go to my shake, but uh, to the California earthquake early warning system in general. My shake is just the last piece that delivered the notification to the users. But uh, as it was highlighted in the first presentation, there are many other components to that system. I mean, even as UC Berkeley, you saw we contribute to with stations with the algorithm. And uh, similarly, we have many other partners that contribute in the same way, like uh, CGS, they are in the room today, Caltech, the USGS, and the, the coordination of Cal OES and the USGS. So, I think we should not take this thank you only for my check, but for the system in general. And this is why I wanted to, to also share that with you. Uh, next slide. So we talk about uh, watch already. Um, yeah, so why a desktop app? 
uh, I think the, the, the original idea was to target professional environment. And uh, I think that the original idea, I think we should give credit to Caloyes, came from you. And, uh, and uh, it's true that it's really true that computers, they remain the primary uh, uh, type of work device. I mean, when we say desktop, we also mean laptop. We are talking in terms of uh, yeah, computers. And it's also true that those computers usually, I mean, especially desktop, they are part of the, the, the building infrastructure, the office infrastructure. They have a fixed location. Usually they have very, very high bandwidth internet. So they are very good device to, to target. Also, uh, we know that smartphone, I mean, we are working with some institutes and companies, and we know that smartphones are forbidden in some work environment, especially lab, where you cannot bring a smartphone inside, also for security reasons. And uh, also, we are aware that in some infrastructures, and especially uh, infrastructure where you have offices in basement, you can have very poor cell coverage. So it's good to have another uh, uh, delivery mechanism or another type of device you can deliver an alert to. Next slide. Um, yeah. And also what we, we quickly realized when we start talking about desktop app is that we can also extend to group alerting. So right away, you can alert all, I mean, a larger group, which is around uh, the desktop computer, not only like to, so we can target not only individual individuals through smartphone, but a larger groups of users. And that was in line also with that objective from CalOES to target critical sectors like first responders, transportation, government facilities, and education. But uh, we also realized that that would allow alerting users who, for example, might not have downloaded the MyShake app, because if you have a computer in a store, for example, a library, a museum, a restaurant, and then the alert would uh, would uh, would be triggered and you will hear in this entire location that an earthquake is coming then right away you will target again a larger group of people and uh, we think that especially if that response is, i mean that alert is uh, is also transmitted uh, through the the more regular uh, way of i mean system to deliver alert for example within schools or airports we think that there would be an improved public response. You can imagine that in a school, if it comes through the, through the usual alert system or in an airport, then people will react even more than we see, even like in this feedback we receive from the users that when the alert comes to the smartphone, sometimes users hesitate, is that real, is that working? But if the message will come through, a, through an institution, through a local institution, maybe there will be even a better uh, public response. Um, so we, I mean, th there is a project led by CalOES to bring, uh, I mean, earthquake early, uh, alert into airports. We thought also that school would be a great target. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, because there are more than 10,000 public schools in California, more than uh, 5.8 million students, and that most children in elementary school, they do not have smartphones. So that's really a public that we cannot um, that uh, basically we cannot uh, target uh, uh, with, uh, with smartphone. And uh, most schools have implemented policies to limit or ban the use of smartphone by students while at school. I know that's the, that's the case for my children. I mean, there is almost a complete ban in their school for smartphone. I mean, they don't have smartphone in any way. But, uh, but uh, so that's, that's really a way to, to try to reach those, uh, those students. Uh, we also saw that if that technology, if the children have their technology on their laptop, then they can bring that technology home. And that would also, another point is that if we involve more the schools, that could allow a broader participation in education effort like the great checkout drill. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so why Chromebooks? Um, to be honest, I think like uh, five years ago, I had never heard about what a Chromebook was. Um, and it's only when my daughter uh, reached uh, first grade that I heard what a Chromebook was. Um, uh, and both my kids now, to be honest, they don't even refer to their laptop as a laptop or a computer. They always talk about Chromebooks. They say, I did that with my Chromebook. I did that with this with my Chromebook. So now I, I'm very well aware about what a Chromebook is. So uh, Chromebooks, they are computers that run a Linux-based uh, operating system called Chrome OS. These devices, they are generally budget-friendly, lightweight, and user-friendly. And most schools in California have a Chromebook program. When I say most school, we try to look for statistics. 
uh, e even like uh, four years ago, I think there was already more than 90% of the schools were the Chromebook program. And we know that with COVID, this number is even higher now, because especially during COVID per period, the school district, they purchased like a large amount of Chromebooks to allow for uh, remote uh, learning. Just to give you an example, we, we started liaising very preliminary discussion with some school districts. And we were discussing a few weeks ago with a school district. And they told us that they currently manage 40,000 Chromebooks, just one school district. So, um, so that's, that's really a very large number of devices that we could target just with releasing MyShake for, for Chromebooks, on Chromebooks, sorry. And of course, another advantage, now we talk mainly about, of course, elementary school, middle school, but there is also, there are also uh, students that will use Chromebooks in high school and even at the university and uh, because of their low cost. And we think that they, having my check on Chromebooks could also allow targeting uh, economically uh, disadvantaged students. Finally, uh, we already have the my check working on Android. And uh, there was a possibility to leverage those efforts because the, the operating system are quite similar between Chrome OS and Android. So of course, you still need to, 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 to display things differently, et cetera, but uh, that was, we, could, we didn't have to develop everything from scratch. So that was, that was one also one of the decisions for starting with Chromebooks. Um, I think now I have a few screenshots. Uh, next slide, please. So if you are familiar with MyShake, you, the, those screens will look very familiar. We just try to, of course, that's a laptop, so the, 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 the application will be wider. We try to rearrange uh, the different button on the screens. Also, we had to disable some functionality, like because in most Chromebooks, you don't have an accelerometer, which is the case on, uh, on smartphones. Uh, next slide, please. One of the very important features we kept, of course, is the home base, the possibility to select a location where you will receive an alert in any case. And we think that's very important, of course, for desktop and laptop computer, because most of the time those devices are, I mean, even if we think about children, the laptop is usually either at school or at home, and usually the two are very close. So, so it's good to be able to identify or to select an area where you want to be alerted in any case. Uh, next slide, please. That just, uh, I mean, this is the feature we tested the most, the alert delivery, of course, that's the most important thing. So what will happen is you will have a pop-up window that will, uh, that will pop out at the bottom of the screen on top of all the other applications that are open, similar, very similar to what you have on cell phones, uh, saying like uh, drop cover, hold on. And again, there will be also a, a voice that will, an audible sound that will uh, inform the user about the alert. Um, next slide, please. I think that's my last slide. Yes, so uh, the plan at this stage, I mean, the, the technical solution is ready. Uh, so the plan is to, uh, is to start liaising with the pilot school districts in California under the leadership of, uh, of Cal OES. And because we started, uh, as we talked at the beginning about desktop in general, to start progressively uh, also having MyShake available to other kind of operating system to target an even wider audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Director, would you like to provide any questions or comments? No, but thank you for that. This is really exciting, especially at the school level. Um, so I hope we can get some traction from, from that. Do any board members wish to ask a question or provide comment in, in a, virtually? Uh, you may unmute yourselves now. Steve, do we have a, a, I think we have a discussion question as well. So again, if uh, not enough time to spark the discussion now, things that we'd like uh, for the board to contemplate and happy to work with you all in the future. All right, seeing, oh, do we have a? Yeah, board member Assessa, Assessa you may ask your question. Hi, um, my question, I guess, I, I've asked this question in other um, presentations before, but the question that came to my mind was just about the, if we're putting this on laptops, just like the data security point of it and how 
I don't know the terminology, so I'm, not, I'm probably not using the right terms, but just in terms of like cybersecurity and people hacking and using through the app, like just kind of that world. Um, I know that if we, I was writing down, like maybe this could be something rolled out on all of our uh, UC issued laptops, you know, to staff. Um, and I know that that would be the first question I would get asked is around that piece of it. Well, that's a, that's an excellent question. Uh, security is of course uh, a top priority for us and that's the same for smartphones. I mean, not only a laptop. So um, first of all, we run the every release through a set of security software that can uh, review any weaknesses, the software security weaknesses that the, the, the new release would have. In addition, Cal OES also requests that we run uh, any new release to a very specific security software and, uh, and uh, before the, the a new release is, uh, is put into uh, the App Store on the Google Play Store. And we had the, the same discussion with some of the school district because this was one of the, the, the topics, security. But, uh, but and maybe I should add that even before you release a new version of an app on either the App Store or Google Play Store, Google and Apple themselves, they also run some kind of security checks in order for us to be even able to post this new, ver new release into, into their so at this stage, we, of course, I mean, security is a topic, but at this stage, we think that we really take a lot of steps to ensure that uh, the, the software is secure, whether it is a release on a smartphone or a desktop or laptop. And if I may, this is Lori Nijera. So um, that's a great question. And early on in the process, we did coordinate with our State Threat Assessment Center and our California Cybersecurity Integration Center, um, as Julian mentioned. And um, they looked at it and gave us the their protocols for um, kind of tightening up the security on it, which um, we're, we're grateful uh, UC Berkeley is um, adhering to and uh, integrating into every release. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions in the next up will be updates on system operations, followed by a presentation from our partners with the California Geological Survey. I will now discuss the updates to system ops as it pertains to the seismic build out. As mentioned before, with the continued development and nearly completed build out of the Q system, we're looking toward operations and maintenance with a focus on refurbishing and upgrading outdated stations as we continue to connect to the state microwave. California Earthquake Early Warning System network of contributing stations has increased to 975 out of the 1,115 target, uh, bringing us close to 87, roughly 87% completion, uh, which is an increase of 38 stations since our last meeting in May. Cal OES and our partners have completed 691 out of the 702 planned queues funded EEW stations an increase of 91 stations since May of 2023. There are 11 remaining stations pending completion. Cal OES Public Safety Communications continues to work to connect EEW stations into the state microwave network and secure tower and vault leases. Uh, there are 19 additional EEW stations online and connected to the state microwave, microwave system for a total of 113 out of the 350 stations with 237 remaining. Now I'd like to introduce Hamid Haddadi, the program manager for the California Strong Motion Instrumentation Program at the California Geological Survey, who's here to provide an update on two system ops projects. Hamid, the floor is yours. <clears throat> So this uh, presentation has two parts. Uh, part one is A, uh, uh, updates and new developments of the application. Second part is a pilot project that type of um, instrument. 
lower cost instrumentation, type of lower cost instrumentation. So the first part, this is the outline of the presentation on the CIS and this. Hamid, I'm sorry to cut in. If you can move the mic up, I, we're not, we're having trouble hearing you online. Thanks. How about now? That sounds good. I hate to make you bend over like that for the whole presentation, but you're coming in much clearer. Problem. So the first part of uh, this presentation on CIS and display, uh, I'm going uh, through three parts on this uh, presentation. One is uh, to uh, go shortly over the history of this application. And uh, then, uh, uh, shortly on uh, explain on the functions and the new developments that we have been doing uh, for this application. And then uh, the uh, other part is related to the same application, but the a web portal uh, that is called QuakeWatch. So I will go through these uh, parts and the difference between CIS and display and QuakeWatch. What are the differences? Then the second part of the outline is on the, the lower cost instrumentation evaluation project that we have been doing uh, jointly with, with Cal OES. Uh, I'm going through the application of the lower cost instrumentation and then a pilot project that we did or still is in progress to uh, assess the usability of one specific type of uh, lower cost instrumentation that is called community seismic network. Uh, right, please. So the first part on CIS and display application. This application was developed uh, over 20 years ago at Caltech uh, with uh, support from FEMA as well as USGS and NOAA. Uh, the application was originally developed for uh, showing the earthquake location and size and was used originally as a basic tool for emergency responders. So this is a display that would be used by any emergency responder that would quickly see where the earthquake happened, what is the size of earthquake and some additional information. And the CISN display is a Java application that needs to be installed on uh, individual computers. And uh, mainly this application uh, was, a, uh, was by doing a subscription. So if anyone needed to use the application, needed to apply and actually go through a process and uh, get subscribed to, uh, to get the application. Uh, later, this application, the, the financial support for the application uh, was disconnected, and that is the time that Cal OES and CGS uh, thought that still there are uh, uh, a lot of values in using this, this application, and uh, uh, Cal OES and CGS continue to support uh, this application. Uh, the development of the application uh, from the beginning was done and still is being done by the company called uh, Instrumental Software Technologies or ISTI. Right, please. So this is a view of the CISN display application. As I mentioned, this is a standalone application mainly used for uh, emergency response. The information about earthquakes come to this application in not real time at this time, but I would say near real time, within uh, one or two minutes after the origin time of the earthquake. There are a lot of uh, customized features that uh, have been uh, added to this application, and uh, mainly for emergency responders. Uh, this is a collection of the information, earthquake information that could be actually collected uh, at different sites and from different resources. But this particular application bring everything together 
and cu customize the information for the emergency responders applications. Also, this application is a way of uh, uh, redundancy uh, access to earthquake information in case that, let's say, internet is out or through the other resources. This application is a redundant way for getting earthquake information. Next slide, please. So, um, as I mentioned, the information uh, provided through this application would be also available through other resources, but this is a one place for getting quick access to all information. As you see here on this slide, there is a button for products and shake maps, and then a lot of uh, links to different parts of the uh, different uh, uh, sites for getting earthquake information all together in, in, one, uh, in one display. And next slide, please. Also, there are a lot of uh, GIS uh, information, GIS mapping uh, capabilities that are added to this application that depending on uh, the usage of the information, uh, different parts of the GIS mapping capability, uh, capabilities could be activated. Uh, next slide, please. So some additional parts uh, were added to the original CIS and display, and uh, this slide shows uh, one of them. So there are cases that we have earthquake swarms or a large number of aftershocks that the emergency responders would like to quickly see the distribution of the earthquakes, the size of the earthquakes and the locations. So this application, uh, this feature shows, uh, uh, actually provides such uh, capability that users can select the area that would like to monitor and then uh, any earthquake in that area within a time frame would show, uh, would show on a plot. And this could be used mainly, as I mentioned, for the earthquake swarms and uh, for, uh, for uh, monitoring aftershocks. Next slide, please. So the uh, CISN display application has an alarm uh, and the new development on this application that uh, 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 were done recently is that uh, now there are ways to customize the areas like uh, on this slide, you see a circle around, uh, mostly around California area that could be used with a different uh, threshold for, uh, for receiving alarm. And also you see a polygon here for a larger area that uh, users can set to receive uh, alarms with different configurations. Like for, let's say, if for California, we want to monitor uh, uh, lower magnitudes also, we can set a different alarm versus the larger area that we may want to monitor larger airspace. So this is uh, uh, a, a new feature that has been added. Also, the duration of the alarm would be configured by users um, in, this, in this feature. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the CISN display application is a, a standalone application, a Java application that needs to be installed on uh, individual computers. Uh, the same idea was used to uh, develop a web application uh, that is called QuakeWatch. Uh, the idea is same as CISN display, but this is a web application. Uh, uh, this application has two parts, one for, again, for emergency responders uh, that can uh, get to, the, to this application quickly and with less traffic on the website. And then they're, uh, they're, they're, the, the, the plan is to have a public version of this uh, also uh, for using the public. Uh, the difference, the other difference between the CISN uh, display and QuakeWatch is that a QuakeWatch, because we use uh, 
the Windows uh, capabilities, or let's say the uh, Windows Explorer cap capabilities, there are more advanced functions available for web applications comparing to the Java application. And some of them I will show uh, on this presentation. Also, uh, it's, it's possible to make it more user-friendly when we use a web application. Uh, the other advantage is that this is a web application. Users do not need to install uh, on individual computers. But uh, the information that uh, are provided through the QuakeWatch, the basic information are same with some uh, more advanced information on the QuakeWatch that I will Explain shortly, please. Next slide. So uh, this is one of the new uh, features that we have in the Quick Watch that uh, we were not able to add to the CISN display uh, the Java application. So, for example, for the emergency response, uh, if emergency responders need to know the, let's say we have an earthquake and. Uh, we need to know how is the, the situation of traffic in different areas or how, how is the weather in different uh, areas. There are a lot of detail uh, features that uh, are added to the Quick Watch, uh, uh, different layers that are added to the Quick Watch. Uh, the other parts that uh, actually um, um, I did not mention is that there, there is an idea to the plan to add the shake alert information uh, to the Quake Watch and CISN display. So that means that as soon as shake alert information is out, uh, the information will be available also on CISN display and Quake Watch, but that part has not been uh, completed yet. Uh, so there are some uh, parts and coordination that we need to do with the USGS uh, on shake alert part to make it happen. Next slide, please. So then uh, going to the second part of my presentation, uh, this is about evaluation of lower cost instrumentation. Uh, why do we need to uh, think about lower cost instrumentation? So there are a lot of uh, activities, let's say, that could be considered for a more intense instrumentation and also for, also for rapid response to earthquake, evaluation of damage of earthquake that has brought up the idea of uh, using lower cost instrumentation. Uh, we uh, picked up one type of lower cost uh, instruments that, is, that was developed at Caltech. It's called Community Seismic Network. And we jointly, uh, CGS and Cal, Cal OES, uh, we are working together to do an assessment of usability of uh, the, this, type, this particular type of uh, instruments and the data that we get. So this presentation is a summary of what we have done so far. Next slide, please. So the application of a strong motion uh, instrumentation in general, uh, we have two types of uh, instruments. One is the high resolution instruments. These are the instruments that uh, all the seismic networks use, uh, including uh, networks in California. Um, for, let's say for the strong motion side of instrumentation, uh, the main uh, usage of the high resolution instrumentation from the beginning of the instrumentation that started was to instrument representative structures and geologic environment. From the beginning, the goal of strong motion instrumentation was not to instrument, let's say, do very extensive instrumentation. It was for uh, putting instruments at representative structure, different types of structures and a different geologic environment. Depending on the type of the soil, uh, we put instruments to to get the typical response of the structures and, uh, and, and ground when an earthquake happens. Uh, then the other application of uh, high resolution in, uh, instrumentation was uh, for the engineers uh, 
to when they want to when they design structures they use high resolution and strong motion data for their design to subject the model of their structure to actual and strong motion data and see what would be the response of this structure basically for a structural design and the long term application is for uh, improving the seismic design code uh, then um, during the last decade, I would say the idea of using uh, strong motion data for early warning system also uh, was added to the application of strong motion data. And that is uh, what we have now. Then on the other side, on the lower resolution uh, instruments, so if we need to put uh, so many, let's say, if we, if we want to make a dense array of, of uh, a strong motion uh, network, it would be costly to put uh, high resolution instruments everywhere. So putting uh, lower resolution instruments that would be lower cost may help to uh, fill the gaps fill the spatial gap where we don't have high resolution instruments. So we can have high resolution instruments at different locations and then fill the gap between with lower cost instrumentation. Um, also such uh, instruments have been used, for example, USGS has used for uh, monitoring aftershocks. Uh, these are portable, they can carry and when there is aftershock in different locations has been used for that purpose. A CGS has used uh, a type of lower cost instruments, what we call it a uh, quake rock. Uh, these are a number of uh, lower cost instruments that were deployed, uh, some in Southern California, some in Northern California, uh, close to the major faults. Uh, the goal for this uh, type of instruments was not to uh, record very low amplitude of a strong motion. So the minimum acceleration that we uh, measure with quake rocks is at 5% of gravity acceleration. Uh, if I say very roughly, that would be something with a shaking at, let's say, intensity four to five. Uh, the goal was to uh, monitor the uh, motion caused by the major faults uh, at not very low amplitudes. Um, also, the lower cost instruments could be used for a rapid response to earthquakes. Like if for structures, if uh, we need to, we want to do uh, a structural damage, a very let's say the first uh, evaluation of a structural damage, this type of instruments could also be used. Uh, so then on this type of uh, um, uh, lower cost instrumentation uh, pilot project that we did, in the next slide, um, I'll go through what we did. This is the community seismic network. We picked up this as one example of lower cost instrumentation. I mean, it's not uh, the only type but this is one type that we started with to uh, use for this evaluation. Uh, the uh, image here shows uh, how the community seismic network instruments look like. Uh, these have the type of accelerometers that are uh, called MEMS sensors uh, with a small piece of computer uh, inside the, this uh, 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 package, uh, very simple, uh, portable, and, um, and the, so this type of instruments were used uh, some areas in, in Southern California by Caltech. Uh, the uh, right-hand plot shows the deployment of these uh, sensors in Los Angeles area. Uh, these are um, mainly uh, installed at uh, some schools in, in Southern California, in Los Angeles area. And the main goal for this uh, application was to uh, study the wave propagation in Los Angeles basin. So they put 
instruments at distance of uh, close to one kilometer uh, uh, apart uh, to get a detailed information from, uh, for uh, wave propagation. Uh, what we did in the pilot project is, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, the pilot project, we put three objectives uh, for, for this project. So we thought we need to compare the lower cost instrument or lower resolution instruments, let's call it, with the higher resolution instrument. So we picked up 10 uh, ground stations and one building, and we co-located the high resolution uh, CGS stations with the lower resolution uh, CSN. Uh, instruments. And the objective, the second objective is to record uh, earthquakes used by both type of instruments. And then we do an evaluation on usability of the records. And the next slide uh, shows uh, the uh, stations that we use for this pilot project. Uh, five stations in Southern California uh, uh, were selected and five stations in Northern California. Uh, we wanted to get some records uh, during the period of this study. So we distributed the stations in both Southern California and Northern California to increase the chance of recording uh, some uh, data during the term of this project. Also, we selected one building on the, the other uh, side. Yes, it shows uh, one building in San Francisco area. This is a 62 story building uh, that uh, uh, was instrumented. This is a joint project of USGS and CGS that we instrumented the building. And we added some uh, CSN instruments at different locations uh, where we had uh, high resolution uh, sensors we co-located those sensors with the uh, lower resolution sensors. Uh, we started receiving, getting some data. And one example is shown in the next slide. Uh, this is one example of uh, one of the earthquakes uh, that we recorded. The red uh, waveform is the CSN record. And the green one is the high resolution uh, record. And then the comparison of the two uh, is shown. And so we are trying to get a good understanding of how far we can go with lower instrument, lower resolution instruments. At the same time, CGS uh, did a data utilization project uh, on the existing uh, CSN data, the records that have already been recorded and uh, already are available. So we in parallel to this project, we have a data utilization project uh, that I hope that, well, we got the report and we are now reviewing the report and the report will be provided uh, soon. Uh, if anyone, every, anybody is interested to see that report. So that is uh, basically where we are now with uh, the two projects and the next slide is uh, the summary of what we have done so far on CISN display and QuakeWatch, and also the other part on the uh, community seismic network, the pilot project uh, is shown on the other side of this slide, if you show. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Hamid. Uh, Director, would you like to provide any comments? I, I don't have any questions, but thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping that we, the lower resolution ones become the thing so that we can get more out there for sure. Thank you. And now we'd like to open it up to the board uh, virtually. If you have a question or a comment, uh, you may unmute yourself. All right. Yes, Deputy Director Nizer. Hami, thank you. Um, I had a quick question on Quake Watch because, um, as you know, I'm I'm one of your biggest fans on this, waiting for it to deploy so I can have it on my phone and my computer and everything. Um, I'm um, I was really interested in the extra features that you were showing that could be of use to our emergency managers and first responders. 
um, particularly like the traffic information. I was wondering where that draws, what source does that draw from? So there are, there are some uh, websites that provide uh, traffic information. And uh, I mean, these are the public information that actually we get access to uh, from different uh, sources. I don't know exactly what is the source I can find out and uh, send. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I think our first responders will find this very helpful, you know, because they can they can have it on um, their phones, on other de tablets, and uh, when they're out in the field, and it can help them move around better. It can also help them know how to move people around better. Thank you, Amit. Uh, we will now, well, let me check any other questions or comments. Okay, we'll now transition. To, um, sorry, I just wanted to kind of add on that when we're talking about first responders, especially when we're talking about um, kind of quick alert and, and, and the rest of the stuff, um, that in our minds, it would be great if we also think about those uh, people who are kind of elevated to first responder status, like our transit operators um, and our Caltrans employees. Um, who also may need the information to be able to do their jobs in those situations. Absolutely. And I think that's the goal of transitioning it to the web application is so that it can be uh, available to more of those who, who need it. Okay. Thanks again, Hamid. Thank you, CGS. Uh, we'll now transition to education outreach, where we'll hear from EEW education outreach lead, John Goodell, and Cal OES's earthquake, tsunami, and volcano program manager, Yvette LaDuc. First up is John Goodell, who will tell us about a partnership with the San Jose earthquakes that was first introduced at the last board meeting. Thank you, Derek. I'm John Goodell. Derek mentioned with the Cal OES earthquake early warning program. And today I'm here to discuss our pilot partnership with the San Jose Earthquakes of Major League Soccer. This was a groundbreaking partnership that had never been done before here at Cal OES. We partnered with a professional sports team with the intent of advancing earthquake preparedness and integrating the earthquake early warning system into large public venues. On the screen here are some of the objectives that we set out to achieve. Enhance public safety by driving substantial growth to my shake downloads. Educate and encourage businesses and Californians to have a plan. Support Earthquakes community as an earthquake education hub. Showcase earthquake preparations at PayPal Park, which is the Earthquakes home stadium. Deliver education messages to thousands of attendees and followers, as well as fans. On the next slide. Again, this partnership had many benefits. Although focused primarily in and around the Bay Area, this was created to be a model process for large venue EEW adoption that can be used for other entities. We interacted with thousands of fans at, other, at, at these soccer matches, including a high of 40,000 fans uh, for their match at Stanford Stadium. We also established a strong relationship with the Earthquakes leadership team as we discussed their role in emergency and earthquake preparedness messaging and their consideration of implementing EEW into the stadium. This partnership also afforded us access to Team 408, which consists of small businesses and other sponsors. Each month they sent out a newsletter, which was distributed to more than 500 businesses uh, within Team 408, encouraging them to download the MyShake app and to go to earthquake.ca.gov for more earthquake preparedness information. So at this time, I wanna show you a video that was produced by our PIO team here at Cal OES. <clears throat> it's essentially an overview of our partnership with the San Jose Earthquakes. Cal OES is excited to kick off a partnership with the San Jose Earthquakes. We share a goal to raise awareness and educate soccer fans about seismic activity. The partnership with the San Jose Earthquakes allows us to reach a vital community. As we're sitting here, ironically, in the area called the Epicenter at PayPal Park. Uh, coming to an Earthquakes game is the best. It's always a ton of fun. The partnership offers soccer fans a unique opportunity to experience a simulated earthquake before and during each home game by catching a seismic ride on the Shake Trailer. The Shake Trailer is just one of our many tools. 
It simulates a 7.1 earthquake, and quite frankly, a lot of times shocks people as to the severity of that shaking. The Shake trailer gives the Earthquake Warning California program the ability to educate fans and help build resiliency for communities most at risk to shaking from earthquakes. We're so close to the San Andreas Fault and the Hayward Fault here. To have a real earthquake safety focus at the stadium is really important. The Quake Stadium also offers fans an additional layer of safety during games. Due to its unique design, PayPal Park is earthquake retrofitted in sections giving the stands the flexibility to move as shaking starts. As I bring my family out to the games, it gives me a sense of comfort knowing that the organization has taken the necessary steps to provide an added layer of protection. Together with the Quakes, Cal OES offers educational tools to learn about the earthquake early warning system. It's a series of sensors around the state that allow us to get vital seconds of advance notice. It's not before the earthquake, it's not predictive, but it's before the shaking, and that's valuable time. The system gives Californians vital seconds to take protective actions like drop, cover, and hold on. It's super important to know that you have to do drop cover and hold on really fast. As the Quakes players practice safety both on and off the pitch, together we encourage fans and Californians statewide to practice earthquake preparedness and share the valuable tools they learned from riding the shake trailer. Because when an earthquake hits, seconds matter. Our earthquakes are a bit different. We don't get advance notice. So what we ask is that you prepare, take a few steps to be in a better position. Go to earthquake.ca.gov, download the MyShake app, look at, the nest, look at some of the tools that are on the site, whether it's your go kit, uh, preparing for yourself and your animals, and be a little bit better prepared. To see more from us, head to news.caloes.ca.gov and follow us on all of our social media platforms. So again, that was, video was an internal product produced by our PIO team here at Cal OES, but as you'll see on this next slide here, some of the assets agreed upon through the partnership also included uh, what you see here. And that includes uh, two minutes of digital LED signage that we had per match. Uh, we were able to do two commercials, one in English and in Spanish. And then we also had a video board that uh, had prior to the game and sometimes during the match as well, uh, announcements encouraging fans to download the MyShake app. And while these assets, with these assets, uh, this helped us serve the DEI communities in and around the stadium in the Bay Area, which included the San Jose Airport, which was directly across the street. So as we go to the next slide here, as mentioned, some of these assets were the player videos in English and in Spanish, and these were coordinated between EEW, San Jose Earthquakes, and the PIO team. And we were able to select a player of our choosing who then spoke on earthquake preparedness and downloading the MyShake app. So. Let's take a look at those videos. Now we'll start with the English version. Built out of back, gives it away. Espinosa! Advantage San Jose! As we create seismic moments on the field, off the field, we're proud to partner with the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services to remind all Californians to be earthquake ready. You can take action today. Download the MyShake Earthquake Early Warning app to receive life-saving alerts seconds before shaking is felt so you can drop, cover, and hold on. California's first in the nation earthquake alert system is available right at your fingertips. Head to earthquake.ca.gov to download it now. And now let's take a look at the uh, Spanish version. Cuando estamos en los campos de juego, creamos momentos sísmicos. Y cuando no es así, trabajamos con la oficina de servicios de emergencia del gobernador para recordarle a los californianos la importancia de estar preparados para enfrentar un sismo y ello nos llena de orgullo. Tú puedes hacer algo hoy. Descarga la aplicación del sistema de alerta sísmica MyShake, la cual te dará segundos valiosos antes de que se registre el sismo, para agacharte, cubrirte y sujetarte. El sistema de alertas sísmicas de California, pionero en la nación, está al alcance de tus manos. Visita la página earthquake.ca.gov y descarga ya la aplicación MyShake.
All right, so those videos were available to us and the earthquakes to share on our social media channels for future use, which we uh, fully intend to do here as we get closer to April as Earthquake Preparedness Month and throughout all of next year. And on the next slide here, we'll take a look at some of the numbers. Of course, the highlight of this partnership from the earthquakes perspective anyways was, was having the earthquake simulator on site for all seven home matches. The simulator, simulator attended the Stanford match and the six other uh, matches at PayPal Park. Uh, it was positioned within what they ironically call their epicenter, which is where other vendors and food trucks are located. We had our typical outreach booth with earthquake preparedness and EEW materials, as well as the uh, simulator station nearby. In total, as you can see there, nearly 1,300 riders rode the simulator and just about 1,600 fans visited the booth during those seven matches. And finally, here, here are some uh, more numbers from the partnership. Aside from having our logo and a link to our website on the San Jose Earthquakes corporate page, as well as a press release announcing the partnership, on social, me uh, social media, we generated 7.2 million impressions for clar clarification purposes. Impressions are the number of times your content was seen, uh, including multiple views from individual users. They are calculated by tracking the total number of times your content was displayed across the platform. So for example, this could be from fans viewing inside the stadium, driving outside and even seeing the video board, uh, which you could from the street, or even those across the street at the San Jose airport, which we're allowed to see uh, from the back side of the video board, which had messaging as well. So for those seven matches that we attended, the total attendance was just under 139,000 fans. And MyShake app, uh, MyShake app downloads surpassed 8,100, which contributed to reaching the mark of 2.9 million downloads that we currently have. And moving forward, we are currently discussing internally, as well with the San Jose Earthquakes leadership, about possibly renewing the partnership for next year. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Derek. Thank you, John. Uh, next, we'll hear from Yvette Leduc, who is here to. Sure. Um, yeah, we'll open it up for questions. Well, John, I don't have a question, but I, I do want to say today uh, the earthquakes uh, announced uh, that they are building some additional training, soccer training fields, and a training facility at the Santa Clara Fairgrounds. So we might have some uh, additional uh, uh, areas to, to partner with them uh, if they agree to go forward with us. So thank you for that. Fantastic, thank you. I'd also like to mention, um, I had the uh, opportunity to go down to PayPal Park uh, one day and meet with the president of the team. <clears throat> and he led us around and kind of showed us um, everything when he took us to the epicenter, which is just this big quad, uh, a big grassy area. Um, he was really animated as he was talking about different ways to um, educate uh, their, their customers uh, when they come with signage and was asking us for advice on things. And, um, and I've since received a, an email from him um, Basically, he's very, very excited and motivated about continuing the relationship with Cal OES and with Earthquake Early Warning. So um, I just uh, want you to know that these interactions that we have with these groups, they, um, they get these um, sponsors or, or uh, champions, if you will. And our hope is that then it will uh, blossom and become a, a bigger group. Um, that we can, you know, other venues that we can get earthquake early warning into. So any opportunities that you can think of like this um, for us to embark on, send them our way. We'll, we'll take a look. We'll meet with people and who knows where it'll lead. Go. Okay. Uh, since we're in the question portion, are there any questions or comments from the board regarding uh, the Earthquakes partnership. Yeah, Derek, I just wanted to say, yeah, that's a it's a very cool campaign, uh, very creative, and I think very effective. Uh, we did some work with the San Diego Padres, uh, especially back in COVID. Uh, that was very effective as well. So, um, you know, my 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 wheels are turning because I think you could really leverage that, especially with uh, professional sports. So, uh, great campaign. Just want to thank the group also for bringing down the simulator here locally to San Diego. 
had a great shakeout event uh, at Cuyamaca College, attracted a lot of attention. So just want to say thanks. I know it's not cheap to move, so appreciate it very much. Thank you. Uh, and board member Amina Sapper. Uh, yeah, I just, I wanted to add, yeah, that I think um, letting people go on the simulator, I think that is um, a really great opportunity. I think everyone will be shocked <laughs> what a 7.0 feels like, um, even if you've felt it before or been in there before. Um, I was also thinking like in terms of, you know, because you are interacting with so many people in a booth, that there was an opportunity to um, not just educate them, but, you know, kind of have a, um, <laughs> like a, a, some kind of thing to give them like a giveaway item and the thing that came to my mind was like the earthquake putty which would probably be fairly inexpensive and a good giveaway because I think people don't uh they're not going to purchase that on their own sometimes but it's really helpful in terms of securing items in your house um and I know that that's a whole funding issue but I just thought that would be like a good um giveaway to give to people I recently tried to move something that I had secured with earthquake putty and could not get it to move. And that was like years ago. And so I think it's just a good way to educate people about there's things in your house that will fall over. And this is a cheap, inexpensive way to secure it uh, during an earthquake. I mean, that's a, a great idea. We do give uh, have several handouts or giveaways and some that we reserve the more expensive ones, so to speak, we will reserve for folks that download right in front of us, but um, definitely we'll take that back. Great idea. Okay. Um, thank you, John. Next, we'll hear from Yvette LaDuke, who is here to discuss this year's great California shakeout drill and tour. Yvette, the floor is yours. And can you guys hear me? Okay. Before I get started, I just wanted to reply real quick to Amina, your suggestion. We actually do give away museum putty. Um, Cal OES actually funds um, the mini awards program done through the Earthquake Country Alliance. Um, so for any members of the Earthquake Country Alliance, each year we do a mini awards program. We give away the putty, straps, hooks, latches, all kinds of tools that folks can install in their homes to increase resilience. Um, and so we have like $500 packages and $1,000 packages um, that we give away to folks who are chosen. So if you're interested, you can take a look at that. So Cal OES does fund that. Um, through our FEMA um, National Earthquake Hazards Re Reduction Program grant. <laughs> Tongue twister. So yeah, so that's great. And we're actually working really hard to expand that program to more folks. So hoping we can get more folks to take advantage of that. All right, so um, I have a little um, lapel microphone because I like to walk around. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about the great um, California Shakeout Tour. So again, my name is Yvette LaDuke and I'm the manager of the Earthquake, Tsunami and Volcano Programs here at Cal OES. And we partner with the Earthquake Early Warning Program to support the tour this year. Um, in addition, um, we really wanted to think about how we could be really inclusive and come up with ways to reach the maximum number of people possible this year with the tour. So we also um, partnered with our public information office here at Cal OES, Listos, California, so we could reach um, some folks, um, some of our non-English speaking communities. We also partnered with our um, community outreach specialist and then also with the California Geological Survey. So we had some of their staff come out and partner with us too. So next slide. So in thinking about places we wanted to go um, for the tour this year, we wanted to make sure we were reaching throughout California to the greatest extent that we could. And we wanted to select locations that had the potential to experience um, high shaking, so high shaking areas, and then also areas where we could re um, reach as diverse as communities as possible. So I'm going to start with a video that was put together by Cal OES Public Information Office that talks a little bit about the tour and our experiences we had during the tour. We've been going all over California to make sure everybody is prepared for the next big earthquake. 
that we're able to, to take our team and go on the road and lead up to this in a way that gets to as many Californians as possible. When I told my mother I would want to come to San Francisco, that was immediately the first thing she said to me, like warning me about the earthquakes. And I never really took it seriously. Uh, the bad experience on this, um, yeah, it's definitely. I yeah. think we need to be more prepared. And this is all an effort to leading up to building the momentum for October 19th, 10:19 a.m. for the shakeout drill. This is a test. Where we encourage everyone to participate in earthquake preparedness drill by drop, covering, and holding on. As we know in California, earthquakes can happen at any time. And that's a really important part about this tour, is getting out there into the communities, talking about it, enlisting more and more partners every year, just to get the word out, and importantly, keep Californians safe. So this year we selected seven cities and the tour was a nine day tour. Um, so there were a couple days um, we skipped over on the weekend. So our tour started on October 11th in downtown Sacramento near the Golden One Center. So this location was really great because we had the opportunity to be where people work. So people who were on their way to work or during their lunch hour were able to come by experienced the shake trailer, many folks in California have not experienced a strong earthquake. Um, so when they got in the trailer, and as you heard in previous presentations and have experienced that shaking, it's really shocking to them. And so it's a really great tool to get people to understand how strong that shaking is gonna be, the potential for it to cause damage in their homes, to cause things to fall off the wall. So really the importance of taking steps to secure um, the items in their home and protect themselves. So really great tool for that. So we set up our information booths. So right as they walked off the shake trailer, they could come over and actually engage with us, talk to us about what they experienced and we could share information and give them information on, um, first of all, downloading the MyShake app so that they could get alerts and then also securing items in their home and how to drop cover, hold on and protect themselves. So um, as a result of our event in Sacramento, we had almost 3,000 um, download apps of my shake. Next slide. Our second stop was in San Francisco at San Francisco State University. So this is a great opportunity. We had a lot of students, faculty, and people in the community stop by this location, um, visit our information booths again, and um, we got a lot of download, um, my shake downloads from that, about 1,800. And another great opportunity here is there's a lot of media in the area. So partnering with the media was a huge opportunity. So not only were we able to engage with the people that came out and met with us face to face, but we could amplify that message out through the media to get out to even more members of the community. Our next stop was on October 13th in Monterey. And we were located near the aquarium. So the great thing about that is not only could we um, reach out to members of that community, but a lot of tourists coming in. Um, so we we're able to engage with folks from other communities who can then hopefully take that messaging out um, even further beyond the area where we were. So we got about 2000 downloads on the 13th Next slide. So then we um, had the weekend off and started up again on Monday, October 16th in Santa Barbara. So this was our first time actually doing a shake trailer in the Santa Barbara area. Um, and we were right by the Santa Barbara mission. So we had trolleys of tourists coming in, got to talk to a lot of folks um, that way. And it was interesting. We actually talked to a bunch of folks from other countries. So Germany was a popular country that day. Um, and so it was interesting to talk to them and they actually experienced the trailer and just to kind of get their thoughts on it. Um, and they were actually really glad to know. They said, oh, we wouldn't have even thought about that. So that was kind of cool. And then also we were in the area, a lot of folks um, said that they felt the shaking from the Ojai earthquake. And so they had a chance to talk to us about their experience, um, which I live down there. So I also experienced the Ojai earthquake. So we kind of talked and um, talked about our shared experience on that. Um, and we had pretty good downloads that day, over 3,000. Um, so that was really great um, to get out into that community and definitely had a lot of really great um, involvement there. Next slide. 
October 17th, we were on Alvera Street in downtown Los Angeles. Um, this was a great location. Um, and we were so happy to have Listos California there with us. They had a booth right next to us. We had a lot of Spanish speaking community members um, come up to this event. So that was great. And it was also located across the street from Union Station. So we had a lot of folks who were getting off the train in the morning, heading to work that stopped by. And then we had some come by during their lunch hour too. So we really got a lot of great foot traffic and a lot of really great media. We had several media outlets. They were there waiting for us to set up in the morning. Um, and they were very engaged, had a lot of great questions. Um, many of them did several um, different um, new segments from there. Um, and so we really believe we were able to reach a lot of people in LA that day. So that was really exciting. We had over 3,200 downloads that day. Right. Um, so then our next event, which we're also really excited about this one, this is the first time we were able to partner with the tribal nations. So we were at the Indian Canyons Golf Resort and they actually had an event going on there that day with their tribal elders. So we got to meet a few of them and also some tribal partners from some neighboring tribes. Um, so they came out and met with us and we actually got to go in. Derek and I both went in during their event and were able to um, each present on the MyShake, MyShake app and earthquake preparedness. That was a great extra opportunity we got um, that we didn't know about. Um, also, this um, event happened the day after the Isleton earthquake that we mentioned earlier, or the day of, I should say. Um, and so we got a lot of downloads that day. So that was kind of a combination of a lot of the outreach that was done by the earthquake early warning team following that earthquake, and then also folks that were um, attending our event that day. So, and we had a lot of community members that walked by, you know, it's Palm Springs, people out walking their dogs, and they came by and got some information. and. That was great, and that was our first time out in Palm Springs. And I'll also mention that we were literally right on top of the San Andreas Fault for that event, too. Yeah, and it was down the street from my sister's house. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was actually a really good first for us, and I think, I think it was a really great opportunity. Then our last stop of the tour culminated on October 19th, with, which was Shakeout Day. And as Jeff mentioned earlier, we are at Cuyamaca College, which is in El Cajon, so it's kind of eastern. Um, we were at the community college out there, so it was a great opportunity. Um, this is where we partnered with our uh, outreach specialist, Tara Calaways, and the CERC programs in the area, and they put on a very large event. Um, we had a lot of um, folks from the college visiting us, both students and staff, and then one of the local elementary schools down the street brought a busload of their kids and so they all got to experience the shake trailer and then at 10 19 we all did drop cover hold on together tina was there with us um so i think for that you know all those kids got a chance to come and talk to us we had um earthquake books there for kids that we could hand out to them um and so we got about twenty thousand downloads that day because that was a big shakeout day so that was really great um really good Hi. oh pardon me Oh, yes, San Diego was there, and, and we did have a couple, um, I know in like LA, we had LA City um, come visit us, so we did have some of our county partners at some of the locations, uh, Santa Barbara as well, too. Slides? Our Shake Tour, I just wanted to mention one more event, Lori, I know you were at this event. Um, on Shakeout Day, we had an event in downtown LA at the LA Regional Food Bank. So we selected this location. This was done through the Earthquake Country Alliance. They are the ones that hosted this event and organized it for us. Um, at the LA Food Bank, and what they're showing the picture is they're actually doing an earthquake retrofit, as we see. Um, and they did this through um, hazard mitigation funding that they got from Cal OES. And um, we are using this as kind of our pilot project. And we are doing through our Cal OES, one of our sub awards for our NEHRP grant that I mentioned, um, we are doing additional food banks throughout California. So the goal is, is that following a strong earthquake with our food banks retrofitted, our food network will still be able to be up and running so that people will be able to get that critical resource that they need. Really excited about that. Um, we have grant applications actually in the pipeline right now for this. Yeah, so the project actually included the 
assessments, both structural and non-structural, assistance with still not the grant application and now the Hopefully we'll get some more done um, following on this. So, um, so there were two press, press con conferences held at this location. The first one focused on the retrofit and the work being done with that. And then the second one was for the actual shakeout drill. Um, so next slide. Kind of a summary of each of the days and kind of the that's media network that was at each of the events. We had several at each of the events, but this kind of gives you a snapshot of kind of some of the main ones in the tech that we were able to get through our media partners. Next slide. Here is a tour summary. So again, we visited seven cities within nine days. Um, the total ad equivalency number, so that is the amount of money that we would have potentially needed to spend amount of people that we were able to spend just by leveraging the partners and hosting this event. So it's, you know, as was mentioned, it's a lot of money to take our shake trailer throughout the state. Um, and visit we got a huge value out of it, just being able to reach all the people we were able to reach. Um, the 500 people that experienced the shake simulator, that number is really key because that's 500 people that we got to talk to. That's 500 people that we got to give our message and give them information and engage with them on earthquake preparedness. 39 media outlets. So in addition to those ones I showed on the previous slide, we had many more participants, again, amplifying our message out to more people. Um, 500 media mentions and then over. So um, we had an increase of my shake downloads during the tour of over 53,000 and then total my shake downloads that was 2,800, and I know John mentioned there's more now because we had some more of those um, San Jose Quates <laughs> events after this, so it's added up. And I know, you know, we kind of look at those numbers and we see those MyShake downloads, and, and that's great, but I think in addition to just the MyShake downloads, MyShake is more than just that alerting app. We now have that number of people that have a planning and preparedness tool in their hands. So MyShake is more than just alert. It also has preparedness information and it reminds people to take that protective action of drop, cover, hold on. Because that's our goal really is to increase our resiliency throughout the state. And we do that by teaching people how to secure their space and how to prepare themselves and take protective action. And they can do that through having that app so that they can get those alerts and then also knowing what to do to protect themselves, securing their um, knowing what to do, I think, helps them so that in their time to stress. Um, so just great tool. Thank you so much for partnering with us. We really Thank you, Yvette. And uh, with that, Director, do you have any uh, comments or questions? No, just that was great. That was great. I, I, I liked the, um, the, uh, the tour versus just one big uh, event. I think you probably got to a lot more people than we could have done. Great selection of places to go. And uh, it was just overall a great tour, great tour. So thanks to the entire team. For doing that. Right, and I believe I saw a hand up for board member Melinda Grant. Oh, hi there. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to just give kudos again to echo the director's remarks. That was phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, just looking at the outputs and the outcomes from the tour, the, the regionality of going across the state, getting into community. I love the last slide that was presented about how this was just not about getting folks on the app. And so um, just wanted to commend folks, uh, at least at our agency, we you know, highlighted to make sure they have the MyShake app. Folks were out there on, uh, to, when you're in Sacramento, at least. And so, um, no, so just kudos, continue to uh, keep us abreast as this continues to grow. So we just really appreciated um, the magnitude of your reach, you know, hearing about the 3,000 downloads, 2,000 and going to each uh, community. So thanks again. Thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no other hands raised or comments, we will now turn it over to our Deputy Director, Lori Najura, to provide an update on EEW's financial picture. 
Okay. Um, the fiscal year 2023-24 appropriation for earthquake early warning is 17.1 million plus a one-time $500,000 specified for receivers for our data casting pilot project uh, phase two. So the, the spending plan for fiscal year 23-24, we, we call it internally Q7, um, is nearing completion. We've received embedded proposals from all of our EEW statutory partners for system ops and maintenance, uh, as well as research and development. In addition, Cal OES staff explores public relations and outreach and education needs and develops a proposal for those resources. And finally, program administration is counted for and voila, we have our Q's seven budget. Uh, we'll have the exact numbers for you next meeting, but roughly it comes out at um, uh, system O&M takes up about 70% of the budget, R&D 11%, PR and outreach and education, 17%, including those uh, shake simulator and tour um, that you just saw. Um, program administration only accounts for 2% uh, of the budget. Um, and then uh, our data casting is um, within the R&D, uh, that number, um, but we're in phase two of uh, our pilot project. So it will be... Um, included in the infrastructure of all of our California public uh, television stations. And then what we need to do is we need to get these receivers, put them around various places. We're looking at both um, residential receivers and enterprise receivers um, in places like air stations and um, maybe, maybe even uh, like uh, assisted living homes. And then um, we'll test those there. And that's part of that $500,000 um, one-time funding we get this year. So um, we, with our funds, we, we continue our outreach funds. We continue to look at, um, you know, the diverse communities. Um, we've got an airport feasibility study in our research and development. We're um, still exploring distributed acoustic sensing or DAS. Um, and then you heard our system ops um, update today. So that's pretty much it for our, our budget. I did want to also mention one more topic and that's the, um, there was an earthquake early warning legislative report required through last year's budget act. Um, and it was recently transmitted over to the legislature. This report was an exploration of various fund sources and uh, whether or not earthquake early warning was an eligible use of that uh, fund source, and finally, whether any of these funding programs were already being used for earthquake early warning. Um, staff will be sending board members the link to our website once the report is posted. And with that, if there are any questions, happy to take them, otherwise end of report. Thank you very much, Deputy Director Nizura. Director, any comments or questions? No, thank you, Lauren, that was great. And to the board online, if you have any comments, please unmute yourself at this time. Okay, hearing none. Uh, next, we will move to the closing statements and public comment. Director Ward, do you have any closing comments? Thanks to everybody. We want to thank our, certainly thank our, our partners at USGS and UC Berkeley and CGS, and certainly our special speaker, Robert Sides, for the presentations today. And, and I hope that these presentations provide our, our members of the board and the public certainly insight in the, into the capabilities of the system and what it, what it can be in the future as, as we move forward. To the members of the board and as we travel down the path toward automation throughout the state, we hope that these discussions will pique your interest and provide us some awareness and some uh, uh, ideas of potential implementation and quite honestly, funding opportunities to equip more uh, of our industries throughout the state. <clears throat> I want you to know that your input is critical to the continued success of earthquake early warning. Um, you represent specific sectors uh, uh, that serve the people of California, and I encourage you to, to stay engaged and bring your ideas and, and um, uh, keeping in mind the people that your industry serves. And, and to thank you all again for your 
participation today and always uh, uh, as we move uh, the board forward. Uh, and I know that we probably won't be together uh, before the holidays. So happy holidays to, to everyone as well. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ward. Do any board members wish to ask any final questions or provide comment? Again, please unmute yourself at this time. Board member Pepper, you may ask your question or comment. Great, thank you. And, and thank you all so much for all the work that's been done and all the work that we know is, is uh, coming to us. Um, as we look at 2024, we're looking you know, for these opportunities to move more towards integration and, and uh, system automation. I do want to make one um, suggestion that to be considered that is to include the GovOps agency on this board. I think as we move forward, when we're looking at procurement opportunities, not just for the state, but for our partners throughout the state, um, it's going to become more important to have our control uh, included in this. Um, looking at opportunities for maybe some streamlined procurement opportunities or what have you, or being able to just provide technical assistance to those entities that um, help may not be uh, exposed to procurement operation um, very easily, and that there may be some creative ways we can do that, um, not just DGS, but also CDT as we're looking at really integrating on the, um, the technology and on the technical side. So. That is my one suggestion um, as we kind of move forward into the next phase of this project. But thank you again for all the work. It really is an incredible, incredible thing that we are where we are today and really exciting um, as to what's coming. Thank you, Board Member Pepper. We have noted that and we'll look into it further. Thank you. Any other closing comments or questions from the board? All right, hearing none, uh, at this point, we'll open up discussion for any public comment. All comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Should you like to comment, please indicate so in the Q&A section or by utilizing the raise hand function of the video conference and the moderator will unmute you. Uh, anyone in the audience, you may approach the public comment podium. Okay, with that, we can entertain a motion to adjourn. Would anyone like to motion? Oh, before we do that, give me a second. Director Ward, would you like to provide any closing remarks? Sorry. Okay, with that, we can entertain a motion to adjourn. Would anyone like to motion? So moved. It's uh, Lori Pepper. Oh, Lori Pepper, thank you. And do we have a second? I can second that, Jeff Tony. All right, all those in favor? Aye. All right, motion passes, thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.